In this comprehensive Agile Scrum course, we will explore the optimal path to becoming a Scrum Master and the essential certifications to pursue. Furthermore, we will dive into the fundamental concepts in Agile and Scrum, including Agile methodology, Scale Agile frameworks, Agile sprint planning, the essence of Scrum, comparisons between Agile and Waterfall model, and Agile and Scrum, and Agile and Kanban. As we conclude this extensive course, we will also address interview questions for Agile and Scrum Master. If you are interested in Agile Scrum certification, consider exploring Certified Scrum Master CSM certification training course. Some key features of this course include two days of online virtual classes, two-year membership with Scrum Alliance, 20 PDUs and 16 SEUs. It includes CSM exam fees as well. By the end of this course, you will be skilled with Scrum Master and Agile methodology, importance of Agile Scrum lifecycle, Scrum terminologies, daily Scrum and review, roles involved in Scrum and distributed Scrum. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. So without any further ado, let's begin by understanding with roadmap to become a Scrum Master. Over to our tutors. Whether you're new to the role or looking to enhance your skills, this roadmap is designed to provide you with a clear path to success. Throughout this roadmap, we will explore the key areas of every Scrum Master should focus on to excel in their role. We will cover topics such as who is a Scrum Master, roles of a Scrum Master, how to become a Scrum Master and Scrum Master's salary and career. But before we begin, let me ask you a quick question. So what is the purpose of Sprint Review? Option A is to review and update the product backlog. Option B is to review and update the Sprint Backlog. Option C is to review and update the definition of done. And Option D is to review and demonstrate the work completed during the Sprint. Now you can pause this video and answer in the comment section below. Alright guys, now let's start with the first topic which is who is a scrum master. So a scrum master is not your traditional manager. They are the glue that holds agile teams together. They play a key role in agile development process and are responsible for facilitating the effective implementation of the scrum framework. They act as a servant leader guiding the development team and the organization in adopting the embracing agile principles. The Scrum Master ensures that the team understands and follows the Scrum practices and removes any obstacles that hinder progress. They facilitate communication, encourage continuous improvement, and protect the team from external distractions. Ultimately, a Scrum Master plays a vital role in enabling the team to deliver high-quality products and achieve their goals efficiently. Alright, so this was about who is a Scrum Master. Now let's move on and understand the rules of a Scrum Master. So the role of a Scrum Master encompasses a wide range of responsibilities, all aimed at facilitating the successful implementation of Scrum Framework. Here are some key roles a Scrum Master must fulfill. First is ensuring obedience to Scrum Framework and values. The Scrum Master ensures that the team follows the Scrum Framework, adheres to its practices and upholds the core values of openness, courage, focus, commitment and respect. Second is observing teams and identifying strengths. The Scrum Master closely observes the team's dynamics, identifies their strengths and encourages collaboration and self-organization within the team. Third is facilitating the daily Scrum meeting. The Scrum meeting ensures that the team hold effective daily stand-up meetings where team members discuss their objectives for the day. They also share progress and identify any obstacles for the day. Fourth is coaching team members. The Scrum Master coaches individual team members to help them achieve their objectives, develop their skills and continuously improve their performance. Next is mentoring team members on Agile principles. The Scrum Master acts as a mentor guiding team members on Agile principles, helping them understand and embrace the values of transparency, inspection and adaption. Then there is leading cross-team communication. The Scrum Master facilitates communication and collaboration between different teams, ensuring alignment, coordination and knowledge sharing across the organization. The last one is facilitating all elements of Scrum framework. The Scrum Master takes charge of facilitating all elements of the Scrum Framework including the planning process, sprint reviews, retrospectives and other ceremonies ensuring their effectiveness and value. By fulfilling these roles, the Scrum Master empowers the team to work efficiently, overcome challenges and deliver high quality products while fostering a culture of continuous improvement and collaboration. So this was about the roles of a Scrum Master. Now let's move on and understand how to become a Scrum Master. So becoming a Scrum Master requires a combination of knowledge and skills. 
here are some key points to consider on your journey. So first is apply the scrum framework in different roles. Gain practical experience by actively participating in prospects utilizing the scrum framework. Start by taking on different roles within scrum team such as team member or product owner. This hands-on experience will provide you with a deeper understanding of scrum process, its challenges and how different roles interact with each other. By immersing yourself in these diverse roles, you will gain a valuable insights to enhance your effectiveness as a scrum master. The next is build your network. Networking is a crucial aspect of professional growth as a scrum master. Connect with other scrum masters, agile practitioners and professionals in the industry. Attend local meetups, conferences and online forums to exchange ideas, learn from their experience and expand your network. Engaging with like-minded individuals will expose you to a different perspective, best practices and emerging trends in the agile community. Then there is work on skills. So developing a wide range of skills is essential for a successful scrum master. Focus on owning skills such as facilitation, coaching, conflict resolution and effective communication. As a facilitator, you will guide the team through scrum ceremonies ensuring they stay focused and productive. Coaching skills will enable you to support the team in self-organization and continuous improvement. Also, effective communication skills are vital for conveying information, facilitating collaboration and build strong relationship with stakeholders. Next one is look for certifications. Start looking for certifications by researching about the skills that you will require in the preparation for Scrum Master. Alright, now coming to the next step which is job search. So when searching for Scrum Master positions, look for organizations that embrace agile methodologies and have strong Scrum culture. Research companies that prioritize collaboration, continuous improvement. Tailor your resume to highlight your Scrum experience including specific projects where you successfully apply the Scrum framework. Emphasize your certification and any additional training or workshops you have completed. During interview, showcase your understanding of Scrum principles, your ability to facilitate effective teamwork and your experience in overcoming challenges within an agile environment. So continuously seek opportunities to enhance your skills and stay updated with the industry trends. With dedication and consistency, you can embark on a rewarding career as a Scrum Master. Now let's talk about the interesting part that is Scrum Master salary and career. So in 2024, the salary for Scrum Master in the US is expected to range between $90,000 and $170,000 per year. This range can vary based on the factors mentioned earlier. Generally, Scrum Master with more experience and expertise tend to earn higher salaries. In terms of career prospects, the demand for Scrum Master is expected to increase in the future as more and more organizations adopt agile practices and seek to improve their software development processes. As outlined in the Forbes report, it is predicted that the worldwide average income for Scrum Masters will experience a 6.4% increase in the year 2024. This means that there will be more opportunities and challenges for aspiring and experienced Scrum Masters alike. In a small software company named Tech Softwares, a team struggled to deliver projects on time and maintain its quality. They hired a Scrum Master whose name was David. David introduced agile methodologies and Scrum frameworks. He facilitated communication and collaboration and introduced daily stand-up meetings, sprints planning and retrospectives. The team became more productive and met all the client requirements. They appreciated David's contribution and recognized the value of agile practices. The team achieved their goals and company's reputation grew exponentially. David continued to guide to the team on their agile journey and they were grateful to their scrum master's impact brought to the company. So hey everyone, welcome to this new video by Simply Learn. If you are facing the similar problems like tech softwares, then in this video, we bring you the top 5 Scrum Master certifications to enroll in 2023. As we saw how Scrum Masters play an important role, let's move ahead in this video by knowing how much a Scrum Master earns. The salary of a Scrum Master varies depending on the factors such as region, company size, years of experience and industry. In India, the Scrum Master salary ranges between 6 lakhs to 26 lakh rupees per annum whereas in US, it ranges from $110,000 to $120,000 annually. 
Companies like Wells Fargo, Accenture and Cognizant hire scrum masters with competitive salaries. So are you looking to be one like David? If yes, then here we present you the top 5 scrum master certifications for 2023. The number one we have is certified scrum master. CSM certification training course. Some key features of this program include 20 PDUs and 16 SEUs, 2 years membership in Scrum Alliance, complimentary access to 15 courses, worth rupees 25,000, and you will learn this in just 2 days. With this, you will be skilled with Scrum and Agile methodologies, importance of Agile, Scrum life cycle, Scrum terminologies, daily Scrum and review, roles involved in Scrum and distributed Scrum. To enroll for this course, you should possess an undergraduate degree or high school diploma. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. The next we have is Certified Scrum Product Owner CSPO Certification Training. Some key features of this course includes two days of online virtual classes, exercise and games to get hands-on Scrum Master practices, CSPO certification included, and 16 PDUs and 16 SEUs offered. Get trained by globally acclaimed certified Scrum trainers. Complimentary access to 15 courses worth Rs 25,000. You are eligible for this course if you have an undergraduate degree or a high school diploma. Any professional who is interested to get certified in Scrum can enroll for this course. Some skills covered in this course includes Scrum and Agile frameworks, release management, leadership skills to manage Agile teams and more. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. The next we have is Professional Scrum Master Certification or PSM Certification. The key feature of this course includes 14 SEUs offered, real-world examples and case studies to clarify core concepts, two-day live virtual class program and more. You will complete Agile Framework and Risk Management and the best part of this course is anyone who wants to become a Scrum Master can enroll this course there are no prerequisites. You can find the course link in the description box. Moving to course number 4 is SAFE 6 Scrum Master SSM Certification. Few features of this course includes preparation and eligibility to take SAFE Scrum Master SSM exam, 1 year membership to SAFE community platform and 2 days of classroom training. This course is best suited for existing Scrum Master managers, team lead and product owner. Skills covered in this course are namely Scrum in a safe enterprise, perform the role of Scrum Master, facilitate Scrum events, facilitate iteration planning, support effective program will make you grab job opportunities in industry. Become a SSM expert? Find the course link in the description box. The next we have is Professional Scrum Product Owner PSPO Certification. Features of this course include 2 days of live virtual classes, 14 SEUs offered in-depth coaching for clearing the exhaustive and rigorous PSPO exam and experiential learning format. With this course, you will learn the foundation of Scrum, core Scrum methodologies and scope of PSPO. So here we wrap up with the top 5 Scrum Master certifications for 2023. There are three distinct roles in Scrum. The Scrum Master, the Product Owner and the Development Team. The Scrum Master assists both the development team and the product owner. The Scrum Master works with the product owner to maximize return on investment. The Scrum Master empowers the development team by fostering creativity, removing impediments, and coaching and mentoring as appropriate. The product owner is responsible for project success by defining the project vision, requirements, and priorities. The product owner has to resist the temptation to manage the team or add more important work after a sprint has begun. The product owner has to be willing to make the hard choices during sprint planning. The development team is comprised of five to nine members with a mix of roles and has the autonomy to self-organize and choose how best to meet the goals of the product owner and is responsible for the same. A Scrum Master is a skilled servant leader. A Scrum Master has very little formal authority. However, 
he or she is expected to assist the team achieve the intended outcomes without interfering with the team's autonomy. The scrum master facilitates the scrum ceremony, such as sprint planning, daily stand-up, sprint review, and sprint retrospective. The scrum master removes obstacles or impediments faced by the team. The scrum master is also a process coach and mentor. The scrum master must not be a line manager of the team. The scrum master is not to be a task master either. The scrum master is not a technical or design authority, nor is he or she a decision maker for the team. Throughout the course of the project, the scrum master must not do anything to rob the team of its empowerment and ability to self-organize. Let's talk about the attributes of a scrum master. Scrum masters need to exhibit responsibility. Even though they are not solely accountable for the team's output, they will consider it their responsibility to remove anything that impacts the team's productivity. They will try to enable the team to do the best that it can. They are humble. They will work in the background and let the team take all the glory. They will use we statements and seldom use any I statements. They are able to set aside their ego and shower all their attention on the team. They are by nature collaborative. They will encourage the team to have conversations among each other and with other stakeholders outside the team. They will nudge all the right people into getting involved and work together in trying to solve problems. They are committed to the team cause. Even if being a scrum master is a part-time task for them, they will give the highest priority to the team's needs. Hence, the scrum master's work allocation, especially if they are part-time, needs to take this into consideration. They are able to influence. They are naturally good communicators and able to convince others to adopt different approaches. They apply various techniques to mobilize organizational resources when required, walk the political tightrope when required, and in general do whatever it takes to get the team the assistance it needs. They are knowledgeable. It is clear that as process coaches for the team, scrum masters need to be experts in the method. They may not be the technical or domain experts. However, they are knowledgeable enough to be able to have productive conversations about the project being done by the team. Tasks for the scrum master. The scrum master is a crucial role and it is important for you to be able to be clear about exactly how the scrum master serves the team. Scrum masters are servant leaders. This means that they put the team before themselves and assist the team. For example, they set up and ensure that the scrum ceremonies are effectively carried out. They ensure that there is smooth flow of information within and outside the team and that there is a spirit of collaboration in decision making and problem solving. Scrum masters must make it their mission to resolve issues that hinder team progress. It doesn't matter what the nature of the issue is, a scrum master needs to mobilize the right resources within the organization to resolve those issues in a timely manner and escalate promptly if that does not happen. We need to understand that in the short duration of a sprint, even a few hours of being stuck can make the difference between a successful and unsuccessful sprint. Scrum masters protect the team. They ensure that the team is not disturbed or asked to deviate from their commitments. If pressure mounts due to unreasonable expectations, they will step in and push back on the team's behalf. They will also play the role of peacemaker when conflict arises by encouraging the parties to focus on the issue, discuss the issue with an open mind, and resolve the conflict. Finally, scrum masters are the process coaches of the team. They use their understanding of agile methods, and scrum in particular, to guide the team through the do's and don'ts of scrum. They ensure that the team stays true to the principles of agile development. Scrum master roles, scrum teams. Before we discuss the role of a developer on a scrum team, 
let's talk about the desirable characteristics of scrum teams. They should be small and nimble. Team size should be no less than three and no more than nine. So that would be six plus or minus three. Exceptions are possible, but uncommon. The small attribute makes the team nimble and improves productivity. It avoids the phenomenon Mike Cohn calls social loafing and instead produces focus on work. The team size should be just large enough that the team members are able to produce and showcase a significant increment of work at the end of each sprint. Sprint after sprint. Self-sufficient and cross-functional. For example, if a team needs user interface development skills, database expertise, and service expertise, all of those skills must be present on the team. Ideally, team members are generalizing specialists. Team members should not only be an expert or a specialist at one aspect of the development effort, but should also have enough skills and knowledge to fill in in other roles as necessary. For example, if you are a UI developer, you should be able to don the hat of a services developer if needed. If a large team is to be split up into smaller scrum teams, scrum favors feature teams over component teams. Autonomous and self-organizing. Teams choose for themselves how they are going to organize and meet the goals of the product owner. No one gets to dictate to the team how to get their work done. The team decides, in collaboration with the product owner, the project direction, and the pros and cons of different approaches. Let's talk about some key decision points or factors to consider when assembling Scrum teams. Feature teams over component teams. The first issue is whether it's best to align team members based on features or components. Scrum favors feature teams over component teams. For example, it's best to avoid putting all of the UI developers together and all of the API or services developers together. Why? Because each feature or user story will require both the UI and services or API. Organizing based on components will reduce the incentive to collaborate. The only reason component teams may be justified would be if the components are likely to be used by multiple other teams. Assemble the right people. It's important to get the right mix of people together for the team. The right level of technical and domain expertise. Teams will naturally have both senior and junior level developers. This works perfectly as there will be stuff that is more appropriate for the junior developers and stuff that is not. Also, one of the risks of a small team is that the team may miss out on broader perspective and dissenting views. One way to work around this is to deliberately favor diversity in all aspects, gender, ethnicity, personality traits, etc. It may take some time for the team to advance through the storming stage of team development and develop the trust necessary to work effectively together, but it can be done. Once a team has been formed, it's best to preserve and assign whole teams rather than individuals to projects. It's best to avoid assigning team members to multiple projects at the same time. Distributed team. A distributed team may be unavoidable. Those based at the same geographical location should be co-located in the same team room. And technology, processes, and ground rules should be put in place to overcome the disadvantages of all team members not being co-located. Plotting team size and productivity will likely result in an S-curve. You can see here that a team can actually be too small or too large. Remember the sweet spot is 6 plus or minus 3. Welcome to Agile Tutorial from Simply Learn. I am CMR. Chandra MR, a professional consultant and coach, certified Agile Scrum Master, PMP, Principal Practitioner, ITL4 Managing Professional, COVID-5 and DevOps. As part of this video tutorial, we are going to understand what is Agile. Let us uh, look at a time in the late 90s, what was happening with software development firms. So they used to follow waterfall methodologies. 
So there used to be expression like sir, you have a problem. So what happened? So our client want a new feature to the software. We are already midway creating the software. We can't add the feature. So what does it mean? So there is a scenario where the change is asked. So why change? Change may be because of adding certain features, removing certain features, modifying certain things already given. What is wrong in that? Why can't we do that change? So now point here is not about doing the change itself. It's about the effort additionally it takes cost, money in terms of which is going out, the effort, then uh, the scope which is going to change at the same time. You also need to put more efforts which will delay the project. So now is it okay? So 90s it was okay. Today is it okay? A big question mark. So why is that not okay? So we need to understand that very clearly. Right? I knew we should not have used the waterfall methodology for development. So is that an issue with the waterfall methodology? So answer is no. If it is today's scenario, answer would be yes. If it is 90s, answer would be no. So what changed in this 20 years or 15 years? The dynamics of the market changed. The behavior of consumers changed. So if you look at anyone who is using any product, it may be a software product or a hardware, uh, like if you have a mobile phone or a television or any application, mobile application or application used on your systems, the upgradation of the new features and functionality of that is improved more and more and consumer wants it more. And you have a very less time to respond. That is one thing. Second thing, there is a lot of competition. If you do not respond quickly, competition will take over. So for you to sustain and grow, it is very essential that you understand this dynamics and you need to respond quickly, which was a bit difficult when it comes to approach what is called waterfall model. Now, how do we address this? So what is that waterfall model is all about? Why is it difficult for us? So the methodology where waterfall model is used involves teams following a series of steps and only going forward after the previous steps are completed. So there is a wait time involved. So until the previous steps are completed, only then I can move to the next. So it is a slower thing. It would take certain longer duration. So it is best used in the scenarios where the teams are small and the project is expected to move in a predictable manner. So predictability is very important. When we follow waterfall methodology, predictability. The variation should be as lesser as possible. So what is that predictability I'm speaking about? As I create this product, as a results comes up, if it takes six months, one year, two years, three years, it's okay. So this is how the product would look like. The predictability, how the product would look like how that particular output would come. So when is that going to come? Is it okay? If I bring that result after two years, is that okay? So if everything is okay that way, without very less, without any variations as such, very less variations, then it's fine. So because of following waterfall model, uh, what is that methodology? What is that flow? We need to understand that. So requirements gathering and documentation is the first thing. What used to happen, which is true in agile methodologies also. But the main difference here is the requirements gathering and documentation happens in detail, a comprehensive one. Now once that is signed off, only then it is moved to the design. Now based on that requirement which is gathered, which is full, comprehensive, then the design will happen based on that. The consideration of process, the products, the people, the environment, then the design happens, which is again a detailed design. Now once the implementation starts, if you find any deviations, the correction needs to be done. Since the design is in detail, the deviation possibility is as less as possible. But the challenge comes up when the dynamics in the market, when the dynamics of customer changes. Customer asks for change, then you may require to do the change. Now when you want to do the change, you may require to do the change only after understanding what would be the impact of this change in the entire output which you are going to create, which is very comprehensive one. So because of this, it consumes time, it consumes extra effort. So it may be a scenario where the scope of work is up to the consumers or to the organization who actually follow waterfall methodologies in today's scenario. So what could be those? So making changes would be difficult as I mentioned uh, earlier. So then it doesn't focus on end user client, customer perspective value. So today I think more and more we're speaking about creating a value in the consumer perspective, customer perspective. Downtime. 
Alex has no idea. What is a downtime? He decided to seek help from his uncle John, a software engineer. John explained that downtime is a specific time frame allocated to deploy or update changes for a software product in a real-time environment. And this happens because most of the softwares we use today are developed using the waterfall model. For example, Cisco, one of the popular leaders in IT and networking globally, is using Agile methodology for their subscription billing platform, SBP, as it was originally developed using the waterfall model. After adopting the Agile methodology, Cisco's product improved its overall efficiency, where defects were reduced by 40% compared to the previous releases, and defect removal efficiency increased by 14%. Upon explaining what downtime is, John further added that downtime is a small part of the waterfall model. It is the traditional way of developing softwares using a software development lifecycle where the whole product is treated as one single unit, and the development of one phase starts only after the completion of the previous phase. Adding new features or updating the existing feature in a waterfall model-based product needs a specific time frame known as downtime to avoid disturbance in the workflow of an organization where applying changes in a waterfall-based product might produce irrelevant results or product failure. The waterfall model is the earliest or the traditional model used for software development, where the output of one phase acts as the input for the preceding phase, consisting of a series of steps, where each phase has specific deliverables that act as the input for the next phase, as it avoids overlapping of phases, as these phases are dependent on each other. This method is simple and easy to understand, where prerequisites are pre-known, documented earlier, and technology remains static where there is no need for ambiguous requirements due to the delay in software delivery. In contrast, the final version is available only after completing the entire software lifecycle process with any deviations if available. Changes in the waterfall model contain high risk as changes include a new, revised version of the entire software running the entire series of steps again and again. For example, a tap and pay machine, where the machine first validates whether the customer's account is funded with sufficient funds or not, and then initiates the transaction for money transfer. Unless the validation is processed, the transaction cannot be initiated. Alex was curious and asked Uncle John, is there any way to overcome the drawbacks of the waterfall model? John replies, yes. Agile methodology was introduced to overcome the problems faced in the waterfall model, where agile-based products are developed by breaking the entire product process into microservices or phases, which is faster to execute and deploy changes on the go. There is no need to worry about other or previous tasks while working on one particular phase avoiding product failure. Agile-based products don't require any particular time frame, downtime, to deploy changes. Unlike the waterfall model, where the whole product is treated as one single unit, and each process is dependent on the preceding processes where deploying changes leads to downtime. How Agile products are developed? Agile-based products are developed using the Agile lifecycle. At first, the developed product is implemented in an actual working environment for reviews from clients and stakeholders to check its deliverables and functionality. After client reviews, the official product is launched in a real-time working environment, where Agile methodology focuses on satisfying the consumer needs by efficiently utilizing the resources and avoiding additional risks or deviations in the product. For example, providing a trial beta version of the software for the end user to experience the software towards its deliverables and results will be helpful in refining and reviewing the product like Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, etc. After understanding all about Agile methodology, Alex asks Uncle John, are companies implementing Agile in their workspace nowadays? John replies, yes. Companies are moving towards Agile methodology due to its flexibility and advantages over traditional systems. By adopting Agile for their Sony Interactive environment, Sony noticed a major difference where there was a reduced planning time by 28% with their framework, and downtime was reduced to the maximum, which made the company save $30 million a year. So here's a question for you. What makes Agile different from waterfall model? A, it is dependent on microservices. B, Agile consumes more time. C. The process is broken down into several phases. D. None of the above.
please give it a thought and post your answers in the comments section below. Three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. Agile methodology aims to meet the consumer's requirements to the maximum in deploying changes in a rapidly developing environment. Where Agile Manifesto principles brings an innovative set of rules and protocols to help developers overcome the challenges faced in the traditional practices, waterfall model, making Agile flexible and efficient. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, a thumbs up would be really appreciated. Here's your reminder to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon for more on the latest technologies and trends. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Imagine you are the captain of a ship and your destination is a successful project delivery. Now without proper navigation and a well charted course, you might end up lost at the sea, right? In the same way, sprint planning is like a well crafted map that guides your agile team towards achieving their goals. It's that pivotal moment where the team comes together, charts its course and sets sail toward a successful and productive sprint. If you are new to Agile or just curious about how teams stay on track and deliver incredible results, you are in for a treat. Sprint planning is a fundamental event in the Agile framework and trust me, it's a game changer. Now if you ever wondered how Agile teams manage to stay on top of their game and deliver exceptional results sprint after sprint, then you have come to the right place. In this video, we'll not only introduce you to the concept of sprint planning but also show you why it's the heartbeat of any successful Agile project. But before we begin, if you enjoy watching these videos and find them interesting, then subscribe to our channel as we bring the best videos for you daily. Also, hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. So let's start this video with what is sprint planning. Sprint planning in Agile is a meeting where a team of individuals decide what work they will focus on during the upcoming time frame, called a sprint. The team discusses the tasks they can realistically complete within the sprint's duration, usually two or four weeks. They consider their capacity, priorities and past performance to create a clear plan for achieving their goals. It helps the team stay organized and on track to deliver valuable results by the end of the sprint. But why is sprint planning so crucial? The first reason is alignment and focus. Sprint planning brings the whole team together to define the sprint goal. This clear objective aligns everyone's efforts and ensures they are all heading in the same direction. With a laser focus, the team can deliver meaningful results every step of the way. The second is prioritization. Agile teams have a never-ending list of tasks in the product backlog. Sprint planning is where they cherry-pick the most valuable ones for the upcoming sprint. By prioritizing wisely, they tackle high-impact items first, delivering value to customers sooner. The third is customer planning. During sprint planning, the team considers their capacity, the amount of work they can realistically handle in the sprint. This ensures they don't overload themselves, leading to better productivity and happier team members. The last is collaboration and ownership. Sprint planning is a collective effort. It encourages open discussions where team members actively participate and share their expertise. This collaboration fosters a sense of ownership and accountability for sprint's success. Let's briefly walk through the typical sprint planning process. The first step is pre-planning. During pre-planning, the product owner prioritizes the items in the product backlog. They also ensures that the user stores or tasks are well defined and contain enough information for the team to work on. The second step is sprint planning meeting. Next comes the actual sprint plan meeting. It's time boxed, usually lasting one to two hours per week of the sprint. In this meeting, the product owners presents the prioritized items and the team discusses them, seeking clarification where needed. The third step is estimation and commitment. Once the team understands the requirements, they estimate how much work they can complete based on their velocity. This process helps them commit to a realistic amount of work they can achieve during the sprint. The last step is breaking down tasks. With the commitments in place, the team further breaks down the user stories or tasks into smaller, actionable tasks. This makes it easier to track progress during the sprint. Before we wrap up, let's share some best practices and tips for successful sprint planning. Tip 1 is regular meetings. Hold sprint planning meetings consistently at the beginning of each sprint. 
This ensures a predictable schedule and keeps the team on track. The second tip is involve the whole team. Involve the entire development team in the planning process. This encourages collaboration, diverse perspectives and a more accurate estimation of work capacity. The last tip is keep it focused. Maintain the focus of sprint planning on what can be achieved in the upcoming sprint. Avoid discussing future sprints during this meeting to prevent distractions. So that wraps up our discussion on sprint planning in Agile. Remember, sprint planning is the backbone of a successful Agile development process, enabling teams to deliver value consistently and efficiently. Agile, we often think of high levels of collaboration and flexibility as well as iterative environment in which requirements evolve alongside the changing needs. So as a result, we also tend to conceptualize Agile as an approach that helps development teams across various industries deliver new features faster. But how do we get there? What does history of Agile entail? And how can knowing the history of Agile help us better understand the methodology and its positive impact on today's development world? Let us look at it. So now, historically, if you see, the waterfall approach was fine. It was delivering the required value, but it required teams to stick to the requirements and scope of work set out at the very beginning of the project and not make any changes or additions along the way as the project progresses. And following that fixed plan could prove trouble sometimes. Comparing to the scenarios which we had earlier versus today, the trouble is more, challenges more. So reason being waterfall methodology prioritized bringing a complete product to market, meaning it could take years before teams finish the project in hand. The scenarios of change, delay in responding to problem resolution, meeting changing market requirements were challenging, which led to introduction of agile methodologies. So the various development methods like Scrum, Rapid Application Development, Extreme Programming, DSDM, Feature Driven Development and Pragmatic Program were introduced. So it all started early, I think in 2001 it was introduced. However, it all started in the spring of 2000 when a group of 17 software developers in Oregon to discuss how they could speed up development in order to bring new software to market faster. So they recognized two key opportunities that achieving this goal would make possible. So reducing the time to the benefits for those users in order to resolve the product market fit and development problems. Secondly, getting feedback from users quickly to confirm the usefulness of new software and continue to improve on it accordingly. So further, these group of 17 developers met again at a ski resort in Snowbird, Utah, US. So they created popularly known as Agile Manifesto. So which laid out four key values. So which says individuals and interactions or process and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following the plan are valued more. Now further between the time when it was introduced till today, Agile has become popular and adoption of that has increased, reason being the flexibility the Agile brought into the system. So several organizations across the world started using it. But what happened further? So Agile gave the result, but there was a challenge. So there were some issues that Agile faced to handle widespread usage. That is mainly whenever there is a scalability requirements. So what is that scalability challenge? It is quite obvious. How can an implementation of Agile for large and more complex project and how hard the process to scale Agile? So this was not clear. The very reason, the challenge which come across, which the practitioners actually faced was, one is lack of experience with Agile methodologies, little understanding of frameworks, methods, and how to implement them. Next large scale coordination. So when I say a specific project, a small project, it was easy implementation of Agile and then going forward. All the frameworks, what I mentioned earlier, it was easy. But the moment you want to do a scaling to the bigger organization, the complex environment, 
the coordination collaboration dependency management between usually uh, distributed teams geographically distributed teams was challenging and thirdly having a clear understanding of what needs to be completed in the sprints and what the bigger picture is so fourth aligning the entire organization and managing committees so definitely organization required a alignment the products or services which are being produced by the project needs an alignment so the need of alignment was basically to ensure the organization gets the value out of whatever they have invested so fifth unrealistic expectation with respect to speed of delivery so unable to respond to this particular scenario so that organization can able to respond quickly so it was not happening so time to benefits i i was mentioning about so generally earlier we used to speak about time to market but today it has been replaced by time to benefits how quickly the value of that particular product or services introduced to the market is realized by the users that is very important so the framework of a scaling agile there are various different frameworks so some of the most effective ways to scale agile uh, uh, would be large scale scrum which is called as less scaled agile framework disciplined agile scrum at scale nexus scrum the spotify model so when i say less the large scale scrum it is a way of scaling agile and scaling scrum to large and big product development groups it has been used since 2005 in different software and hardware products in industries such as banking and telecom so when it comes to scaled agile framework so it is a set of organizations and workflow patterns intended to guide enterprise in scaling lean and agile practices so it is uh, made freely available by scaled agile inc which retains the copyrights and registered trademarks so the disciplined agile delivery which is also called as dad is a software development portion of the disciplined agile toolkit so dad enables teams to make simplified process decisions around incremental and iterative solution delivery so dad builds on many practices by uh, advocates of agile software development including scrum agile modeling lean software development and others so scrum at scale so scrum originally if you look at outline in the scrum guide is a framework for developing delivering and sustaining complex products by a single team so since its inceptions its usage was extended to the creation of products processes services and systems that require the efforts of multiple teams whereas scrum at scale was created to efficiently coordinate this new ecosystem of teams it achieves this goal through setting up a minimum viable bureaucracy via scale free architecture now coming to next one the nexus scrum so this consists of multiple cross functional scrum team working together to deliver a potentially releasable integrated uh, increment at least by the end of each print based on dependencies the teams may self organize and select the most appropriate members to do specific work so lastly the spotify model which is basically people driven autonomous framework for scaling agile while emphasizing the importance of culture and network this methodology uses squads tribes chapters guilds the foundation of which is squad which acts like scrum team so further let us look at the our focus area of this particular video which is basically what is scaled agile framework so scaled agile framework as i mentioned earlier consists of collection of principles best practices and processes that would enable large organizations to adopt agile methodologies so it would help them deliver products and services of the highest quality faster so safe is best suited for complex projects that involves several large teams at the projects program and portfolio levels the current version of safe is version 5 which has seven core competencies based on which it can help organizations the large organization in specific so safe has certain core values which are basically alignment built in quality transparency and program execution 
so when i say alignment so i was mentioning about aligning with business uh, requirement business strategies so it is needed to keep pace with fast changing disruptive competitive forces and geographically distributed teams while empowered agile teams are good even great but the responsibility for strategy and alignment cannot rest with the combined opinions of the teams no matter how good they are instead alignment must rely on enterprises business objective so it also need to require to keep up with the change the competitions and then the dynamics across in the environment where organization is doing their business so next is built in quality so built in quality is basically to ensure that every element and every increment of the solutions reflect quality standards throughout the development life cycle so quality is not added later building quality is prerequisite of lean and flow without it the organization will likely operate with large batches of unverified unvalidated work which leads to the product or services which is not okay and also that would lead towards excessive rework which is not good and slower velocities which is not allow the organization to respond quickly to the dynamics of the market so third one is transparency so transparency which basically need to enable teams to rely on each other there should be trust which needs to be built so based on which high performance can happen so wherever the trust exists so when the business and development can confidently rely on each other to act with integrity particularly in times of responding quickly or to work out a solution for resolving something which is actually not allowing things to move forward so without trust no one can build high performance teams and programs so the confidence needed to make reasonable commitments is very very essential so fourth is program execution so safe focuses on working systems and business outcomes which mainly for example for teams to execute and continuously deliver value safe places an intense focus on working systems and business outcomes so this is because while many enterprises start the transformation with individual agile teams they often become frustrated uh, as even those uh, teams struggle to deliver most substantial amount of solution value reliability and efficiently so delivering solutions with better value reliability and efficiency effectiveness is very very essential and here we are speaking about ensuring the scalability to the bigger organization so program management plays a very important role so that requires lot of communication collaboration so without a better execution of that without handling it better things cannot go the way it is required so various competencies safe recommends so safe competencies involves team and technical agility agile product delivery enterprises solution delivery lean portfolio management organizational agility continuous learning culture and then lean agile leadership so when i say team and technical agility so agile teams are high performing and cross functional business solutions are built by business and technical teams delighting customer with high quality output so this requires an able team which understand agile frameworks which follows it which complies with it and also technically sound so agile product delivery which actually refers to the scenario where the customer is at the center of organization's product strategy so development is based on cadence and releases on demand exploring integrity deploying and innovating continuously then enterprise solution delivery so building big system with the help of lean coordinating and aligning the entire supply chain evolving the live system continuously requires to ensure the visibility of entire enterprises and providing solution accordingly lean portfolio management which basically focuses on aligning the strategy funding and execution optimizing operations across the portfolio decentralized decision making powered by lightweight governance then organizational agility a lean agile mindset is created across the enterprise it is very essential for example i am working in a project i have an attrition 
if hr does not understand my project dynamics and if they are not agile me as a project organization becoming agile will not help similarly the one the procurement similarly the processes so very essential for all the organization units to become agile so that business operations are able to complement contribute that speed or the change what is required so opportunities and threats are addressed quickly so risks are identified and addressed quickly so they are worked on it so risk management can become easier with the involvement of right stakeholders continuous learning culture so in this scenario everyone learns and grows together exploration and creativity are a very important part of organization where there should be an innovation creation execution maybe i think uh, i come across certain terms like intelligent risk taking so learning through failures failure should lead towards inquiry not towards blaming so this these are all the things which are more and more discussed when we want to make an organization a learning organization the continuous improvement of solutions services and processes is everyone's responsibility then lean agile leadership so by modeling desired behaviors inspiring others aligning words actions and mindset to lean agile principles and values lead change and guide others so this requires a lot of accountability and ensuring the correct information well informed individuals to take forward things now how does safe work so safe considering those competencies what we looked at the seven competencies so let us see what happens in each of the competencies how does safe work using this competencies so firstly let us look at team and technical agility which uh, basically uh, involves an agile team of 5 to 11 members which helps defining build test and deploy products so this is done by dividing the task into small easier to manage time box iterations right then uh, scrum team led by the scrum master and supported by product owner plan and then deliver the product in increments so further after delivery they have a retrospective to determine how the iterations went and how it can be improved this is incorporated into next iterations planning phase so the method used here could be scrum or kanban so both are popular the combination of this can be used so scrum basically helps in ensuring that things moves in iterations and everything is visible and delivered whereas kanban supports in terms of making it more visible and able to manage it better so agile product delivery so a large organization usually consists of several agile teams each led by their respective scrum masters so these teams together represent agile release trains also called as art so they usually involve 50 to 125 people so art are cross functional and involve everyone who understand customer needs and can help with building and delivering the solution required so art uses an agile delivery practices like the one used by the teams to deliver value to the customers so it uses time box iterations called program increments or pis which usually involves four to five iterations all the teams they get together to plan their work during pi planning events so they should work together they should have full visibility while doing it so three major components which are required when we do agile product delivery is release train engineer then project management and then system architect so release train engineer represents the coach of the art facilitated the pi planning process the project management provides the vision for the project and backlog of the tasks system architect provides architectural guidance for the process and then uh, the teams then make plans regarding what they would be able to deliver so the program board is also drawn up to determine dependencies between the teams which also goes through program iterations the pis as i mentioned earlier then after every iterations the art shows the integrated output to all teams through a system demo so after the pi is complete all team get together to retrospect event called the inspect and adapt events so further a continuous delivery pipeline is set up based on the art 
DevOps practices are also used to ensure values available on demand. I think the term DevOps is becoming more and more popular today, which actually providing that visibility, need for collaboration, need for cultural transformation. So which helps in terms of bringing that agility across the organization as well as learning organization. So one of the principles of DevOps itself says continuous learning. There should be continuous experimentation and learning, risk taking, intelligence risk taking and also we come across speaking the concepts like same and army concept like introducing failures into existing systems and learn what can fail and what is the solution for it. And that can help in terms of becoming more resilient and reliable system. So DevOps has become popular and adoption of that discussion on that is uh, become more common across the organizations. So next enterprise solution delivery. So enterprise solution delivery, let us look at a scenarios where a single art may not be able to deliver an appropriate solution. A solution train which coordinates multiple arts and suppliers would be able to provide solutions in large and complex scenarios. So meaning consideration of enterprise as a whole, seeing end to end organization, entire visibility. So basically what is that we are trying to achieve? So alignment we discussed about which requires the objective of organization because organization is investing. So whatever we do at various different levels should complement to each other rather than contradicting. So that complementing thought or complementing visibility can happen only when someone has a bigger visibility. Enterprise world wide outlook. Then uh, the three major components that are required in enterprise solution delivery would be solution management, solutions architect and solution train engineer. The solution management holds content authority over what needs to be built. Solution architect handles the architecture across the arts. Solution train engineer enables coaching and facilitating of solutions train events. So next is lean portfolio management. So lean portfolio management provides ways of creating and combining strategic themes and portfolio vision. This enables solution development to be aligned with enterprise strategy. So the moment I say lean, firstly we should keep in mind that it's about creating value to the stakeholders. That is first thing. Second thing is elimination of waste. Now when I link this to strategy, when I link to, towards the organization's directions what it sets, and while going in the directions, I should ensure no defects are actually moved downstream or are eliminated when it goes to downstream. So customer should see the value, which is very important and identification of all the contributions of waste has to be done and eliminated. So this ensures there is a value in organization's value stream, which also ensures that these value streams remain funded. So funding plays a very important role. So next is organizational agility. So when I say organizational agility, it should ensure the organizations, various business units in the organizations should be with that dynamics of agility, which organization is going to, which organization is moving to. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a project where you have, you have adopted agile methodologies, it's quite obvious for your pace, for your flexibility, for your speed, other business units which are working with you to support you should also complement to that. They cannot become slower. They cannot have their own pace of uh, doing things. Like in your project, you have a procurement, you have a recruitment, you have some claims to be cleared from HR. Maybe you're dependent on certain tools and environments. Now, if these are not agile, if these are not responding in the same flexibility or same speed, what the agile project team requires, then obviously things will not flow further. Now, when I say agile, obviously we introduce products or services quickly to the environment. Now, someone needs to manage. We have operations. Now, can operations manage the products or services which they are not aware of? Now, even there the agility is required. As I keep introducing the new products or services to the environment, operations should also be well informed and educated about it so that they can monitor and manage them effectively and efficiently. If they fail, I think users will not have a good experience. Your product or services may have a great features functionalities. But however, if whenever there is a query about that product features or functionality, whenever there is an issue, the incident, 
which user actually calls. The first point of contact for any users would be the operations. The moment operations fails to respond with the right clarifications or right resolution quickly, then obviously user experience will result in not a good way. I think customer satisfaction or customer delight will be at stake. So even operation should become a giant. So rest of the business units which are supporting, like funding we spoke about. If funding is not done in an agile way, obviously the things cannot move smoother or easier. So everything across organization should become agile. Organizational agility has to be ensured. So enabling portfolio with strategic agility, making change in the direction depending on the scenario, then encouraging the growth of lean thinking people and agile teams. So people should be working towards ensuring creating value always. Every task, every transaction is what they do, should be enabled through it. So they should also know whatever we are doing, how this particular task or the work or the results, what I am creating results in value addition or value creation to the organization. Does it really align to the organization's requirement? Is it fulfilling? Maybe customer as a stakeholder or my own organization, the business unit, which is actually investing on this project. So in that context or in that perspective, everyone should be aware of that alignment, the directions, the vision. Then uh, focusing on value and helping with organizing and reorganizing, building an environment for the flow of value across the organization. So everyone should realize value. So value is what? Value can be uh, defined in the perspective of every individual's background and every individual's requirement because it's a perceived one. So there may be real thing what we have created, but perception is different. So the perceived versus what is actually created should be as closer as possible. So zero deviation is expectation, but difficult, but however, it should have a tendency towards it. It should actually be very near to that perceived reality, but two things involved. One is that I create a features and functionality for my product or services, which fulfills customer requirements. Customer may not know, not well educated, not aware of it and don't know how to realize that value, how to know how these features and functionalities can be used. So now if you educate that customer, the user, how to use it, what are the values it can create and do some uh, exercise in terms of educating, training, coaching, customer can visualize it and just understand that. That is one possibility. Second thing is customer is very matured and our product does not have features and functionality required. So these are the two scenarios which require a lot of interactions and engagement so that increasing in terms of usage of product and services and realizing those values. So this has to be encouraged more and more. So further continuous learning culture. So when we say learning, it's quite obvious. Organization should keep maturing. Individuals in organization should keep maturing in terms of capabilities, in terms of ability to do new things, innovate, the knowledge, the capabilities, skills, competencies. So that can be possible only through learning. So learning should be continuous. So this ensures an atmosphere of innovation and constant improvement until organizations becomes a learning organization. So meaning at every level, each individuals, each professionals, each engineers, each executives invest their time in learning. They learn through what they are doing. They go through formal training. They bring in that formal training, learning into the actions here. For there, they, they learn. So continuous experimentation, creating an hypothesis, working on those hypotheses, aligning that to the requirement of organization and seeing how is it complementing to the organization's requirement. So seeing through these are very essential. So the organization which is having the culture of continuous learning can sustain and grow continually. There is no question of looking back. If organization has a scenario of not learning, they will fade away. They may fail to exist. So it is very much required to understand the market dynamics, continuous learning there. Capabilities and skill enhancement, continuous learning here. Innovations and making things better, continuous learning. So continuous learning helps organization to be there in the industry and continue with the competition. So next is lean agile leadership. So it's quite obvious leadership plays very important role. It's about guiding. It's about owning. It's about showing directions. It's about ensuring everyone does the task. Everybody is motivated. So the leaders must embody, teach and exhibit 
lean and agile principles and values so firstly they should understand what it is they should be aware of it they should have an exposure to it they should have full awareness of it as i was learning about continuous learning culture in the previous point so leaders should do that first so only then i think the followers will actually have learning adopted to themselves and things move smoother and better and this should happen across the organization so by doing this it is quite obvious organization can become better agile organization is complemented to achieve the objectives and goals what they wanted to accomplish and uh, there is a safe configurations which one needs to ensure which involves essential safe raj solution safe portfolio safe and full safe so when i say essential safe it acts as the foundation for all safe configurations and is the easiest starting point for implementation so large solution safe it is used for building large and complex solutions whereas portfolio safe provides principles and strategies that can enable business agility in an enterprise so when i say portfolio it should be understood as a portfolio of an organization as a whole the service portfolio the product portfolio the business portfolio so understanding of that and complementing to that is very essential so full safe is a comprehensive configuration that includes all competencies and ensures business agility so advantages and disadvantages of safe so advantages involves enabling decentralized decision making it eases collaboration across cross functional teams it ensures decisions are made with strategic objectives in mind so disadvantages include additional layers of oversight which makes it resemble the waterfall approach the top down approach can limit understanding of the software life cycle and cause bad planning so visibility providing that visibility is very essential then larger planning cycles and roles that are fixed in development cycles if you are interested in agile scrum certification consider exploring certified scrum master csm certification training course so hurry up and enroll now find the course link in the description box so before we go and understand what is the scrum itself so let us look at the history of scrum where it started how it started so right down the line uh, during 1986 the name scrum is first introduced by the management experts ikujiro nonaka and hirotaka takuchi so japanese so now this terminology was introduced but later in 1995 jeff uh, sudland and ken shubar creates the early version of what would become the agile methodologies so now earlier 1995 so need for agile was sensed and it was spoken about i mean why do we need agile methodologies in future what would be the future organization which would look like so that would trigger in terms of what kind of approaches we may require to have so further 2001 the agile alliance is founded and first look on scrum the agile software development with scrum is published so then further uh, down the line 2002 the scrum alliance is founded by swebber and certifications are added then uh, later 2006 the scrum mink is created the certified scrum courses are taught so people started getting certified on uh, scrum then later 2009 scrum.org is created which offers the professionals scrum series of certifications then 2010 the first scrum guide is published so which made available to everyone so from then i think uh, the more and more people start adopting scrum methodologies Now interesting part is the journey started from uh, 1980s till 2010 various changes which has happened to this particular methodology but one thing we should keep in mind is same 20 years back or 15 20 years back if we go the need for agile was not seen so it was spoken but need for agile was not spoken much but today we are speaking about it more and more the reason is i think the change in the market condition the increase in the competition the need of responding to the change which is asked by the consumers or the market variations has become more and more important for organizations and service providers if they don't respond to the change they may lose out in the competition so their survival is at stake so it, it is very essential for them to understand this dynamics and respond to those scenarios quickly 
so that's where the adoption of agile the benefit of adopting agile were realized and scrum become popular so what is scrum so let us look at that so now scrum is a framework that enables teams to work together means collaboration is very important while we become agile so with scrum team one can look i mean see and experience so learning from experiences happens so those are captured self organize working on problems so they work together they discuss brainstorm reflect on their victories means any achievements has to be celebrated acknowledged quick wins recognized and their losses to improve so wherever the things doesn't go good necessary corrections has to be done i think scrum approach would help in terms of uh, doing it quicker better then some of the benefits using scrum would look like team can provide project deliverables and in an efficient manner so in time a, we are completing all the features and functionality so the the entire model the methodology what is there which helps in accomplishing those then further time and money are used efficiently so time is very important giving results in a mentioned schedule is very important ensuring results are coming up effectively is important efficiently the performance of that products now since we are creating those small piece working piece in every iterations so that experience of using that would also be there and quick feedbacks will come back so that time and money is saved and we are doing in time so projects are divided into smaller units called sprint so the iterations what i am speaking about the quick iterations of activities which happens uh, during the adoption of scrum when organization adopt the scrum methodology so it is called a sprint it's a time box iterations which will have a set of subset of uh, product backlog taken as a sprint backlog and those users stories and epics are delivered as part of that uh, sprint and then uh, those are reviewed on a daily basis as part of daily scrum meeting and also we have other meetings which will happen when we go and look at uh, scrum uh, methodology how this happens i think we'll get better visibility work best for fast moving projects now whenever we need to respond quickly whenever we want to move faster now remember when we say moving faster means it doesn't mean that we can allow any defects to happen we can ignore something we cannot do that we need to ensure everything is taken care at the same time all those results what are created has to be acknowledged right confirm yes it is defect free so all those which is supposed to be addressed are taken care and things are moving faster and better and the results are according to what was actually expressed as a requirement it is fulfilling those then scrum meetings provide the team great visibility since there is a daily scrum meeting which keeps happening people speaks about what they have done from the previous uh, daily scrum what is that they have accepted they will complete and what is complete is everything is complete or something is pending if it is pending why is that pending and what is that you are going to do further before the next daily scrum meeting so these are discussed understood so that there is a quick 15 minutes meeting which gives the insight and further wherever there is a dependency deviations which occurs further maybe scrum master sit with them separately in a, uh, to understand that in detail so daily scrum meetings give the quick insights so that it increases the visibility what is happening on ground constantly involves feedback from clients and customers as i mentioned earlier while discussing about agile active involvement of a customer is very essential so customer should give the feedbacks whenever that working piece of the application or a product is given so only then uh, whether the product or that module what is created is uh, having that features and functionality which helps in providing necessary requirement fulfillment is that happening or not then making changes based on feedback are very easy because everyone is informed and they are aware of what is being changed and what needs to be changed then individual efforts of the team members are given focus yes individual efforts is essential at the same time each team member cross skills we call it as self organizing team as i was mentioning earlier so each team member will have a different different skills different different capabilities and also cross skilling within the team is encouraged so that the ownership on individuals uh, deliverables and team as a whole working together to deliver some features functionality can also be accomplished right 
then scrum team involves product owner scrum master and then scrum team so each of these are different roles having their own objectives to accomplish with the specific directions and each of these cannot be merged like for example the roles and responsibilities of product owner cannot be given to single individual who is a scrum master so both the roles cannot be given a single individual because it conflicts the objectives of both the roles so thinking about putting this one of the team member becoming scrum master or product owner thinking in that angle is also something which is which will not work which will not uh, give the required results so now what are these roles what are the responsibilities where is the focus of each of the roles so let us discuss on that now when it comes to product owner so the product owner is primarily responsible for maximizing the roi by determining the product features prioritizing it into a list what needs to be focused on for the next sprint and constantly reprioritizing and refining it so the key points what we need to see here is so one is determining the product features maximizing the roi the second one and then reprioritizing and refining the product backlog now why is that needs to be done so maximizing roi in the sense obviously product owner should closely work with the business and have an insight towards what is that business require what is that customer require how it helps customer to accomplish that result so that it helps the justifying that investment what they're doing with the products features and functionalities then uh, speaking about reprioritizing and refining it it depends on what features needs to be delivered in what order so there is already an order which is defined so based on the change scenario you can reorder it and product owner has that ownership and responsibility so the entire focus is on ensuring the right product backlog prioritizing it and also adding that user stories and epics into product backlog depending on what makes sense to the business so the scrum master the next role helps teams learn and apply scrum to obtain business value means scrum master closely works with the team so he or she helps remove impediments what is impediments something which stops to move forward something which doesn't allow to deliver things the way it is required something which stops right so that needs to be eliminated that needs to be understood what are the impediments so when we say impediments what are the impediments we can think of the skills and capabilities of the team that is one thing maybe the testing environment maybe a process so many things comes as a bottleneck or impediments which stops things to move smooth or forward so scrum master should work on it identify that and support team or guide team to overcome those so protects them from interfaces that helps the team to adopt agile practices so encouraging team to adopt agile practices and ensuring they demonstrate it and provides the required value as it's move forwards so since scrum master focuses one side in terms of making scrum team to work whereas product owner is looking at the entire product backlog and working more closely with the business so they need to have a good handshake uh, to ensure things go well but these two roles cannot be merged because since it has a two different angles and two different dynamics so spending time accomplishing both the things may become very challenging and conflicting and the prioritizing will also be difficult then scrum team is a collection of all the individuals who work together to deliver the requirements of the stakeholders so self organizing team what i was mentioning what we were discussing earlier so these teams comes together each of the team member will have various different capabilities so they contribute at the individual level and as a team has a whole complement or contribute towards ultimate output and outcome and value what they need to create and this team should have a clear understanding about the deliverable what is being done so is that deliverable what features and functionality what they are thinking is that going to create that value ultimately what is need to be achieved the requirements fulfillment which is which needs to be happen to the customers so they need to have that understanding the direction should be clear to the team so there are certain artifacts to look at when it comes to scrum so let us look at that so now we speak about the artifacts which are the components of the scrum process that can improve transparency and understanding of the work so there are three artifacts mainly which we call it as a product backlog sprint backlog then product increment so let us see what is this one by one 
so when i say product backlog so it consists of list of new features changes to be made to existing features the bug fixes changes to the infrastructure and several other activities that the team needs to deliver to ensure a particular outcome so this list of product backlogs becomes with required features and functionalities what needs to be delivered so the prioritization of this has to happen in what order what needs to be delivered so the product backlog is the full list which needs to be delivered as part of this project and as the project progresses a lot of uh, new backlog item would be added to the product backlog uh, as the dynamics of the particular uh, scenarios keeps changing so keeps adding reprioritizing additional uh, items to the backlogs are added depending on what are those dynamics so further looking at a sprint backlog so sprint refers to that short period of iterations right so uh, which a team aims to get a given amount of work done so it helps teams deliver working software in a frequent manner so sprint could be between 1 to 4 weeks long depending on what is that deliverable is so sprint backlog is a subset of product backlog so that prioritize item what is taken into sprint which is a time boxed iterations the sprint backlog contains the task the team aims to complete to satisfy the sprint goal so what is that sprint goal so each of those iterations the time box iterations will have a specific objective to accomplish so the sprint goal is the objective decided for the sprint as an outcome of negotiation between the product owner and the team so what can be delivered how long it takes to deliver so when it has to be delivered the target may be given by product owner but is it possible feasible to complete it there next there is some negotiation which happens there so they decide they agree yes we can do it we cannot do it if at all we can do it what is that it takes in terms of effort time and cost so everything is decided discussed so that objective of that particular iterations is agreed upon so once it is agreed i think a team should first identify the tasks from the product backlog that need to be delivered to achieve the goal so these tasks are then added to sprint backlog so there should be an agreement between both and once it is added once it is agreed as part of that sprint the deliverable the output of the sprint would be the one which needs to be completed as part of it the objectives the goal the results which is specific working software then product increment so this refers to the combination of all product backlog tasks completed in the sprint and the value of the increment of previous sprints now when we speak about lean lean speaks about elimination of waste it speaks about value streams now in each of the sprints as we have a working software being delivered now each of these piece should keep complementing to the what is the one which is already delivered and what is being delivered in future so keeping that in mind every deliverable will be implemented or configured in such a way that there is no specific bottlenecks there is no specific constraints which arises so this needs to be kept in mind which requires the entire visibility into what is that ultimate objective we are going to accomplish so in this product increment all those combination of the product backlog task which is being done should keep this in mind team should be very clear about it so i in the first sprint i delivered something in the sprint two i delivered something but i cannot integrate them they cannot work together it will lead into the further issues and then complications that should not happen so when we say agile it's about moving faster fine so responding to change fine but that should not lead towards further complexity it should make things simpler smoother so scrum is stressing on that part so an increment refers to inspectable usable work done at the end of the sprint it represents a step towards overall goal or vision of the project as i was mentioning then the outcome should be in usable condition even if the product owner doesn't decide to release it so it should be in usable condition so two things we speak about so one is uh, release other one is deployment now people usually get confused between release and deployment so release about this part what we are speaking about product is usable so it is released product is usable but only after deployment user will have an access to use it so that is a difference release makes that product usable whereas deployment makes it available to the user to use so this difference people should know so release doesn't mean that it is already available for user to use so this understanding of the difference should also be there so that one can understand what it means by release as well 
and what it means by deployment. That's why when we speak about DevOps, we keep speaking about uh, CI/CD. In CI/CD, we speak about uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery, and continuous deployment. So in continuous delivery, we're speaking about release basically. So once it is released, it becomes usable. So once it is deployed, it is available for user to use. And that's about the Scrum artifacts. Now let us look at uh, Scrum framework, how that Scrum framework looks like in entirety. So what are the components comes into picture? Already we spoke about the Scrum approach itself, what it is. Now we spoke about understanding artifacts. Then we spoke about roles in Scrum, the activities for each of the roles we understood. Now where do we see all of this when we look at a Scrum framework? So that picture let us see. So when we say Scrum framework, already we spoke about the product backlog. We can see that it is in the left side in the beginning. We have a sprint planning. So we spoke about sprint, the time box iterations. And uh, from the product backlog, the items which is moving towards sprint, to a specific sprint, what needs to be delivered, which become sprint backlog. Now the backlog items are taken and Scrum team work on it and does a daily Scrum meeting. And once the deliverables of that particular sprint happens, then there is a review on it. Then the increment is delivered and at the same time that retrospective what was planned versus what is delivered that is checked if you look at from sprint review so you have a retrospective to check what is planned versus what is being delivered at the same time that review points will come and get updated to product backlog as well to the product owner so product owner should be aware what is delivered what is pending to be delivered and that increment is further delivered so these increments what is delivered to production what is deployed in the production should have values that integration which happens both all the increments coming together to provide that fulfillment of the requirement as well as creating that value what is required so product backlog is the first step of scrum framework is a set of list of tasks to have successfully achieve the goals of the stakeholders we discuss that while discussing on product backlog so further sprint planning happens where the team determines the tasks from the product catalog they will work on and aim to deliver during the sprint. Now this is negotiated, understood, agreed and then most towards sprint to get delivered. Then sprint backlog are the tasks discussed during the sprint planning means the previous step and also during the script planning and then added to the sprint backlog. Once it goes to the sprint backlog as part of the time boxed iteration sprint the deliverables should happen. Now scrum team, the scrum team which is actually self-organizing team as we mentioned, maybe 5 to 10, 9 members of team working on the task in the sprint backlog and they will also have a daily scrums where the team also discusses for 15 minutes on the events where the team member synchronizes activities and plan what they aim to achieve in next 24 hours, what is accomplished against what is discussed in previous daily scrum and then if at all any further discussions need to be done in the correction of those that can be taken as a separate meeting not as part of the daily scrum so generally daily scrum meeting would be 15 minutes it should not go more than that it's an indicative time so quicker updates to understand what is happening then uh, the sprint review happens where uh, once the sprint is complete so sprint review happens which involves the team the scrum master and product owner and stakeholders to understand what is being agreed upon and what is being delivered so reviewed is that fulfilled in the entirety that is discussed and then uh, during this meeting the team shows what they accomplished during the sprint it allows time to ask questions make observations give feedback and provide suggestions right then the product owner also presents the product backlogs talk to the stakeholders to get feedback for upcoming sprints and about things related to the backlog now this one sprint is complete for the next sprint what should be the prioritization so the product owner has to sp speak with the stakeholders so that there is a good understanding good handshake that what needs to be delivered and what is the priority in the given list then sprint retrospective happens so after the sprint review uh, sprint retrospective happens so during this meeting what went well like past mistakes potential issues what are the new ways to handle them which are required to be done correctly in the next uh, iterations or next sprints needs to be identified. 
data from found from here are incorporated when planning the new sprint so it's like, works like a lessons learned what went well what did not go well what is that we did for those what did not go well so what is that learning we have in these iterations so how can we ensure that in the upcoming iterations the same mistakes are will not repeat so those can be uh, discussed documented and then consider while moving to the next uh, sprint then the increment is a workable output which is given to the stakeholders so this is where the user actually sees their workable piece working item and then they give necessary feedback as well on the particular uh, application piece or software uh, piece then there is something called scrum board which is used during this flow of scrum right from product backlog to the creation of that increment so let us look at what is a scrum board which is used during the scrum practice so scrum board is a physical or virtual tool that helps team to visualize items in the sprint backlog so it helps in tracking what is being delivered what is in progress and what needs to be delivered further so it shows all action items during the daily scrum helping keeping the team focused on tasks that need to be completion and the priorities of those the scrum board is usually present in a place that's accessible to all team members it is a visual board right and can be physical whiteboard and stickers or virtual software tools which can be used and displayed on the screen so the scrum board is divided into different slots like to do in progress and done so when new sprints are started the existing board is reset and new scrum board is created so since it is visual system i think it is taking the thought from kanban so visual system always works effective because the moment i know i see something is uh, uh, put ag against my name that i need to complete this it's quite obvious to me that i will put efforts to complete it so it's a conscious effort what i will put it works on my consciousness so something which is not visible to me it is not out of sight is out of mind so i will not work on it so i may there is a tendency to forget so if i see it regularly if i have that uh, feeling or that vibes which comes to every individual such so someone is everyone is having a visibility to it something is pending against me so i am answerable that consciously that comes to the mind so and people start working on it and there are two main approaches to project management the traditional waterfall approach and the agile approach originally agile developed as a way to better manage software development projects agile emerged in the late 1990s specifically in response to the challenges encountered when managing software development projects using the traditional waterfall approach specifically addressing the burdens of heavy documentation and frequent changes in requirements Agile techniques and best practices began to emerge and gain prominence in software development projects. This led to a meeting in February 2001 in Park City, Utah, where 17 leading software developers wrote what has become known as the Agile Manifesto. Let's review the Agile Manifesto for software development together. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. Before you take your Agile Scrum Foundation certification exam, I recommend you memorize these four lines. We call them the statement of value. And you can see that on the right-hand side, those are items that are more relevant for the traditional or waterfall approach. And on the left, you have those things that are more agile in nature. Let's review each of these four lines. individuals and interactions over processes and tools clearly any project requires processes and tools however individuals and their interactions deliver better results when the emphasis is not on the processes and the tools working software over comprehensive documentation documentation here refers to things like status reports progress reports detailed specifications which do not really demonstrate any real progress or value 
Therefore, the emphasis is on working software that can be delivered and demonstrated. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Organizations need to be flexible and accommodating rather than following detailed definitions listed in contracts. Responding to change over following the plan. In Agile, small pieces of working software are delivered to the customer incrementally. And the customer is involved in the project from the beginning to the end. So in Agile, we are responsive to the customer and willing to make even mid-course corrections in order to deliver to the customer the value that the customer wants. Remember, you will be tested on these four lines. So again, I urge you to memorize them. In fact, knowing these four lines and having a feel for what they mean will actually help you get to the correct answer on many questions in the exam. Here we can see what it might look like to manage a project using the waterfall approach. You can see that the system and software requirements would need to be identified and documented up front. That would be followed by the necessary analysis and program design work. Then comes the actual coding and testing. That's then followed by the handoff to the customer or to operations. As you can see, there is a heavy upfront cost of documentation, as well as the status reporting that would be to be done during the course of the project. You can also see that it would be difficult to respond to change in this kind of an approach. In fact, the Standish Group issued a study that showed that software development projects using the Agile approach succeed three times more often than when using the Waterfall approach. The Standish Group defined project success as being on time, on budget, and delivering all of the planned features. The study summarized as follows. The Agile process is the universal remedy for software development project failure. Software applications developed through the Agile process have three times the success rate of the traditional waterfall method and a much lower percentage of time and cost overrun. Now, let's talk about Scrum versus Agile. Firstly, let's have a look at methodologies. Now, Agile is a set of principles that are iterative and incremental. Agile has a number of different methodologies you can choose from. There's XP, Crystal, Kanban, even Scrum for that matter. Let's talk about Scrum now. Scrum is an implementation of the concepts of Agile. So basically, most of the important components of Agile can be applied to Scrum as well. It provides the customer with incremental builds that are delivered to the customer in the span of two to four weeks. An organization can be Agile, but not practice Scrum. However, an organization cannot practice Scrum without being Agile. Next up, let's have a look at projects. Agile is more suited towards projects that have a small development team that consists of experts, whereas on the side of Scrum, it's usually better suited for projects that are subject to a large amount of change and that too rapidly. Next, we have leadership. Now for Agile, a project head takes care of all the tasks and has a very important role to play in the process of Agile. A project head represents the entire team and is responsible for getting issues resolved by assigning them to the appropriate members of the team. In Scrum, there's no leader. There's a Scrum master who can overall guide the Scrum process, but the team addresses issues by themselves. It usually involves cross-functional and self-organizing teams. Next up, we have flexibility. Agile is relatively more rigid than Scrum and cannot handle changes with ease. It also requires a lot of upfront development process and changes within the organization. With Scrum, you can enable team delivery. Agile requires frequent deliveries so that they can get feedback from the end user. This in turn will help make the product better. The product is delivered as well as updated on a regular basis. With Scrum, after a sprint, feedback from the client for a build is provided to the team. Scrum involves daily Scrum meetings to review 
and get feedback to determine the next steps of the project. The next sprint is only planned by the team after the current sprint is complete. Next, we have collaboration. With Agile, collaboration involves face-to-face -face interactions with team members of other cross-functional teams. For Scrum, daily stand-up meetings take place with specific roles like Scrum Master, Product Owner, and the Scrum Team. And finally, we have Design. With Agile, the design, as well as its execution, it's relatively simple. With Scrum, the design and its execution can be innovative and experimental. So you might be wondering, which one should you choose? Now, among both these options, there's one thing that will remain common, Agile. Now, what you can decide upon is which Agile methodology you will be choosing. Is it Lean, is it Kanban, or is it Scrum? Now, if you do want to know more about how Scrum and Kanban are different from one another, you can check out our video, Scrum vs Kanban. The final step is increment. Here, a workable and usable output is provided to the stakeholders. So now that we know how Scrum works, let's have a look at Kanban. Kanban comes from the Japanese word Kanban, which literally means signboard. Like Scrum, Kanban is a popular agile framework that is a visual system by which the work can be managed with ease as it progresses. Kanban uses something known as the Kanban board to make these things possible. With this, you can easily identify bottlenecks and then fix them cost-effectively at optimal speeds. The main focus with Kanban is transparency. Since everything related to the tasks are on the board, everyone can keep themselves updated. It also ensures the teams focus on their current tasks until they're done. This limits the amount of work that's in progress. So on the Kanban board, work is divided into smaller, more manageable pieces. The work that's needed to be done is written on a note or card and placed on a board. Columns on the board help represent where each item is with respect to the workflow. Now let's have a look at what these are in detail. Let's find out how Kanban works. Now the board consists of three major components. There's the to-do list, which represents items that need to be completed. The ongoing column, which represents items that are being currently worked on. And the completed or the done column. Now these represent tasks or items that have already been completed. Now although this is a physical representation of the board, several organizations use software versions of the board that replaces the sticky notes with cards that can be moved from one column to another as work progresses. Now an example of such a software is Trello. So if you want to learn more about Trello, you can check out the link I'll be adding to the live chat in a moment. At this point, you guys must have realized how similar these two frameworks sound. So let's run through some more of their similarities. Let's find out how they are similar. Firstly, they both have principles of lean and agile, which means reduction of waste, and both of them are time-boxed and iterative approaches that enable product delivery in an incremental manner. Both these frameworks aim to reduce the amount of work in progress. This forces the teams to ensure that they focus on a smaller set of tasks. This also makes blockers and bottlenecks a little more visible. In both cases, the work is divided into smaller, more manageable units. Both of these frameworks use pull scheduling. Now this means that products are only built based on demand rather than forecasts. Transparency plays a major role in both these frameworks by helping them drive process improvement. And in both cases, the release plan is continuously optimized. And finally, 
Both these methods aim to deliver releasable software often and earlier than expected. So now that we've reached midway, let me ask you guys a question. Do you guys use Scrum or Kanban in your workplace? Or do you use these software for personal reasons? What exactly do you use these for? Let me know in the live chat. Now let's have a look at how these two frameworks are different from one another. Firstly, let's have a look at cadence. Cadence refers to the amount of time in a sprint or before a release. So when it comes to Scrum, the entire project is divided into time constrained iterations, that is into smaller manageable units. But when it comes to Kanban, it's even driven. The next criteria we're going to have a look at is release methodology. In Scrum, releases take place after each sprint, which usually takes two to four weeks to complete. For Kanban, releases take place in the form of continuous delivery. They happen in such a way that changes like new features, configuration changes, bug fixes and experiments get to the users in a safe, quick and sustainable manner. Next up, let's have a look at how changes are addressed in both these frameworks. In Scrum, no change can be made while the sprint is in progress. Once it's complete, changes can be considered in the sprint plan and then added to the sprint backlog. With Kanban, changes can be made at any time and incorporated into the workflow. Now, let's consider the metric that's being measured. In Scrum, for planning and process improvement, velocity, which is the measure of the work that can be completed by a team in a sprint, is the key metric. In Kanban, lead time is the key metric. This represents the period of time between a new task's appearance in your workflow and its final departure from the system. Next, let's have a look at how teams work in these frameworks. In Scrum, you need a cross-functional team to achieve your goals in a sprint. In Kanban, cross-functional teams are optional, but specialized teams that focus on particular aspects of the workflow are required. Now, let's talk about new additions. In Scrum, just like handling changes, you can't add any items between a sprint or an iteration. In Kanban, new items can be added to the board as long as there's capacity available for it. Now, let's have a look at the job roles within these frameworks. Scrum has three major job roles, Product Owner, Scrum Master, and Scrum Team. With Kanban, you don't have any specific job roles. Now, let's talk about representation. Or moreover, let's talk about how data can be represented. With Scrum, the board needs to be reset once a particular sprint is complete. With Kanban, the board stays persistent throughout the entirety of the project. And finally, let's have a look at project length. With Scrum, it's better suited for longer projects. And with Kanban, Projects that can be completed in a shorter period of time are better. So which one should you choose? Now selecting from these two methods is mainly based on the requirements of the team. Do you expect your project to be shorter? Do you want to make changes at any time? You don't want to set up job specific roles? Then Kanban is the framework for you. Or do you want a long running project with different job roles and involving cross-functional teams. Scrum is the answer for you. Based on the differences we discussed in the last topic, you can make an informed decision. Now, let's have a look at some of the popular companies around the world that employ both these frameworks. Some of the companies that have successfully implemented Scrum are Facebook, General Electronics, and Adobe. Companies that have implemented Kanban are Siemens, BBC, and SAP. If you are interested in Agile Scrum certification, consider exploring Certified Scrum Master CSM certification training course 
So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. I want to do team is I want to, before we get into the user stories, I want to go to the whiteboard and I want to just give you a little bit more information that might help us in organizing our discussion that we're about to embark on here. <clears throat> so a word that is not in our slides is themes. Themes are epics and user stories grouped together. You know, similar epics and user stories grouped together for planning purposes. So an epic is big. Um, you would never do an epic, in, or pardon me, a theme in a sprint. It's too big. Um, so it's used for planning purposes. Below that, I would put epics. Epics are low priority, large user stories, meaning that an epic will eventually have to be disaggregated into multiple user stories. The reason it would be low priority is because if, it w if an epic was higher up on the product backlog, um, it would have to be more detailed. That's when you would break it down. So epics are usually going to live at the lower uh, priority levels of a product backlog. And as user stories are completed and the epic rises in priority, it will eventually be broken down into um, more manageable user stories. So great big low priority user stories. Then we have user stories themselves. User stories are functions or features that the product owner wants to have developed. A user story turns into working software that provides value to the customer. And, um, and the product owner is the customer voice. The product owner is the one who would accept or reject completed user stories. And then there are tasks. And a reminder, when we were talking about the sprint planning meeting, we said the sprint planning meeting is uh, got two parts to it. The first part is selecting all of the user stories that are going to be included in the sprint and then disaggregating each of those user stories into tasks. That's done in the sprint planning meeting, and then those tasks are the things that are actually then done when the uh, work of the sprint begins. User stories can be estimated in story points or ideal days. Most teams favor story points. They might start with ideal days, but they will then usually end up going to story points. Um, tasks are uh, estimated in I, ideal time, which is usually ours. Okay, so now back to our slides. <clears throat> so to, at the top left, a use case could be an example of a user story. So it's something that um, the user wants to do and how the system should support it. Um, like um, a use case could be um, select and pay for items in a catalog. Now that could actually be an epic or maybe a theme because maybe it would get disaggregated into log on screen, uh, catalog, uh, shopping cart, and checkout. But the, so the use case could either be a standalone user story or it could actually be uh, a number of user stories um, that would result from it below that requirement. It could be a functional requirement, a technical task, or even a bug fix. So I'm going to go back to the whiteboard, and a product backlog is going to have a lot of user stories that come from the customer, right? Whatever the customer wants done. But the team may know that it has to do some development work in order for the user stories to even be able to work. You know, there's some system level non-functional requirements that need to be done. And so there could be tech user stories. And then, can you see this low? I can't see your chats, but then there could also be defect user stories. There could even be risk user stories. 
Now, what could happen is that um, the product owner ranks these in priority. So this one first, then that one, then that one. And the team says, well, the only thing is, is that um, we have to do some development work before we can actually do user story two. And so what we really need to do is insert that before the, uh, the second priority user story. And so the priority of the user stories in the product backlog, while it might start with just being, you know, simple functional user stories coming from the uh, product owner, it will evolve until it includes some other things that are also considerations when it comes to uh, priorities because of, you know, successor, predecessor relationships, dependencies, and things like that are um, considerations. <clears throat> A user story, be, uh, back to the, the uh, screen, um, bottom left now, the user story um, can use a fictitious user or a persona to help uh, the team or the, the team and the product owner to get an idea of, okay, who's going to be doing this function? Uh, what are they going to need in order to be able to complete the function, et cetera? So you try and um, come up with an actual, well, a fictitious, but a person who's actually doing it to kind of get out of the realm of, you know, listing requirements and, you know, specs and things like that and say, okay, what's the user experience need to look like? Top right, template. A portion of a user story is, um, let me back up. So a user story card um, is usually going to contain um, a brief description of the user story using some kind of a meta language format, like we're suggesting right here. As a user or persona, I want this feature so that I can. So not unlike our um, estimating session here. As a frequent traveler, I want to eat grapes so I can be healthier. In the one that we uh, didn't do, uh, the inventory system, as a customer, okay, there's a, a user. I want to get cash back so I don't have to wait in line at the bank. Okay, here's another user story. As a consumer, I want the shopping cart functionality to easily purchase items online. And maybe that could be customer as well. Um, as an executive, right, as a suit, I want to generate a sales report so I know which departments need to improve their productivity. As a buyer, so you can see I, I tried to come up with these different roles right here, executive, buyer, sales rep, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> And that's the format. As a type of user, I want some kind of goal um, or feature, and uh, so that's some kind of a reason. Um, the, below that, connect. Connect the dots by writing all of the user stories necessary to uncover the entire use case. So like we were talking about right here, if you want to be able to purchase items online from a catalog, that might be uh, uh, multiple user stories in order to support that use case. And so, of course, um, we would want to be able to connect the dots and see where all the user stories fit in into the overall goal of the project or release. And the stories, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, are grouped to form an epic or higher level story, so epic or theme, um, stories can then be split into child stories or tasks. And so that's what we were covering before, right? So you have um, themes up at the top. That's the biggest grouping, if you will, used primarily for um, you know, uh, high level planning purposes. So you have your themes, then you have your epics, which are large user stories. Um, low priority, and they're going to have to be broken down into smaller user stories. Like in the question that we had at the end of the, the last section where um, the product owner needed something done and the team said, well, based on the size of this user story, it's going to take three sprints to do. 
Well, a user story has to be small enough to be completed within a single sprint. So a sprint can contain more than one user story, but a user story cannot span sprints. So that feature or function that was in the question was probably more like an epic. It was something that would need to be uh, disaggregated into smaller user stories, or perhaps it was more of a use case that would need more than one user story in order to actually deliver the overall use case. Let's see, as a product supervisor, I want to see an unfinished part list at the end of the day so that I can reallocate work the next day. Great user story description. Well done, Viraj. Um, did you hear that, team? As a product supervisor, I want to see an unfinished part list at the end of the day so I can reallocate work the next day. That is a well-crafted description of a user story. Now, here are some things that I want you to memorize. You were hoping I was done with the memorization part. So I want you to um, remember that we have to invest in our user stories. And I was going over to the whiteboard and I didn't change cameras, so let me do that. I recommend um, you know, figuring out how you memorize best so that you can if, um, well, not if you wanted to, what I recommend is being able to write out all of this stuff on plain white scrap paper in about 14 minutes because that's the amount of free time you have in the tutorial when you're at the, uh, or when you're taking the test. Um, Exin does it a little bit different. You maybe won't have a tutorial. The only time you'd have a tutorial is if you were at a center taking a test. Um, Exin has other options, like you can do a paper-based test um, uh, where you get a third party, you know, a buddy or somebody who will agree to sort of proctor the test for you, or you can do it on your laptop all by yourself. And they have software that watches you while you're taking the test, and they require you to take the laptop and do like a 360 so that um, they can verify that you don't have any cheat sheets up on the wall or anything like that. But the point is, is um, you got to have this memorized, um, whether you're going to dump it out on the paper or not. Um, when I took the test, um, I actually did the paper-based option. Um, and that was because of some time constraints and it was the quickest way to get me into the test. And so I didn't write out any of the stuff I'd memorized, but I had it memorized. And I had it memorized well enough that I could kind of recall it in my mind's eye. Okay, so we're talking about user stories and you have to invest in your user stories. You know I like memorizing things by creating these charts that have the first letter of the word or phrase that you're memorizing in a separate column. And then I make up a story, you know, that uh, um, reminds me that I've got to have I-N-V-E-S-T. This one is pretty easy, probably just invest works. Um, but th so let's go over that. I stands for independent independent meaning that each user story stands on its own. Um, you don't have, when we're doing Scrum, you don't do a user story that won't result in working software. We just talked about the description of user stories, right? So it's a user that needs some kind of functionality for some kind of a reason. And they're all independent. Will they work together? Of course, they'll work together if that's a necessity, but um, if you developed a logon screen, you could demonstrate working software for the login screen. There might be another user story that is, um, you know, has to do with displaying uh, the catalog and being able to flag or select items that you want to purchase, but there'd be working software for that. Would they work together? Yes, but each user story would complete um, or result in some kind of working software, and they have to be independent. Negotiable. Negotiable in the way the user story is going to be implemented. 
the product owner doesn't dictate to the team. The team doesn't say it, it's only this way and we don't want to hear anything from you. So there are discussions about the size and implementation for each user's user story. So the product owner can't make it so detailed that there's no room for discussion and the possibility of, you know, the team coming up with solutions other than what the product owner was attempting to dictate. Um, v stands for valuable, meaning each user story has to create value for the customer or the end user. E it has to be estimable as in estimatable, except estimatable is not really a word. It's estimable. Um, and S is for small, has to be small enough to be done in a single sprint. If we're doing two-week sprints, it has to be able to be done in two weeks or less. If we're doing four-week sprints, it could be a larger user story, but it would still uh, have to be done in four weeks or less. And then the last one, the T, is testable. Every user story needs to be testable, and it needs to be testable at two levels. Remember our triangle? It needs to be testable at the intrinsic quality level, unit tests, etc., and also testable at the extrinsic level, which is the customer point of view, which is acceptance. So every user story uh, has to be testable. Okay, so that's invest, and so let's add that to our list of things to memorize, invest. And then the next one we have here is um, the three C's of a user story. So the first C team is card. So user stories should be able to be written on a four by six inch index card or some uh, media similar to that card. <clears throat> the, the second C is conversation. The user story card is the item that is used for the team and the product owner to talk and discuss in order to make sure that the product owner and the team are on the same page when it comes to what is actually supposed to be developed and um, uh, what, you know, so what it's supposed to look like at the end, which leads us to the third one, which is confirmation. Each user story essentially has to have acceptance tests um, in it itself. So card four by six conversation, that's the starting point. That's where uh, the team and the product owner discuss and then eventually there will be acceptance tests included on the user story card um, in order to be used during the sprint review to um, assure that it's acceptable, that there's confirmation. Okay, so, oh, let's add that to the memorization list. So, three C's. All right, now I've got an example here of a user story card. So we're looking right here. And if you were to go out on the internet and search um, user story cards, um, they would be similar. There would be some differences, of course. Um, <clears throat> but typically what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a title or a name for the user story. And then there's going to be some kind of unique identifier, like user story 321. Then there will be the description like we just talked about. As a librarian, I want to have the facility of searching a book by different criteria so that I will save time while serving a customer. Then there might be some other descriptive words or links to other information that might be necessary. And then there would be acceptance criteria or tests. Sometimes these get included on the back of the card, but the point is, is that they are on the cord, on the card rather. Then there will be an estimate of size. It could be ideal days or story points. As I mentioned, most teams do story points. That's more likely what you'll be tested on as opposed to 
um, ideal days, but you know, we'll cover both so you understand uh, the differences. <clears throat> Um, there is probably, it's not listed here, but there's probably going to be a um, value point assignment. This is where the product owner um, kind of determines in a relative way the uh, value of the stories. Just like we were doing in planning poker, the product owner might say, well, this story is twice as valuable as, a, as uh, this other one comparing them together. And this is what um, these value points are what's used to uh, prioritize the user stories. That's supposed to be a V, as in value points. And then typically there's also going to be a indication, sometimes it's just by colors, um, it could be words uh, that has to do with, um, you know, where the story came from. Did it come from the customer? That would be considered a functional requirement. Um, if it came from the team, that would be from the technical domain. I'm trying to write where from. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not me, team. It's the mouse. Clearly, <laughs> it's hard to uh, do that. That's from, where from. Um, here it's got uh, customer tech. You could also have defect. You could maybe have risk. Um, and then there's also going to be an X factor, um, which would be <clears throat> some kind of word probably like um, stable, um, erratic, um, incomplete, something like that. To, uh, so that the team is designating the user story in uh, respect to the amount of uncertainty or risk that's associated with that user story. And because all of that's a part of the story, right? The story is going to be turned into working software. There may need to be uh, some efforts to actually figure out how to actually do that user story. <clears throat> So that's the X factor. Um, over to the right here on the same chart, we have some comments about um, if you are using a uh, software package, excuse me, like Trello or Jira or something like that, excuse me, <clears throat> the user story cards will generally be able to contain more information using, you know, dynamic links and things like that. Um, could even include things like responsible team member, or depending on how you're doing it, you would break the user story down into tasks, and you might have team members assigned to various tasks for the user story. Um, okay, so that's typically what a user story card is like. Sometimes they're cards, sometimes they're like on sticky notes, and they're put up on a Kanban board if you're using Kanban to track the project. <coughs> If you have a story that is too large to be completed in a sprint, it's going to have to be subdivided, or we call it disaggregation, into um, smaller user stories. And there's uh, three ways that we're proposing here that you could go about doing that. You could split it based on operational boundaries. For example, as an operator, one needs to manage reservations, which could be split. For example, there could be one portion that is uh, that has to do with making a reservation, another one that has to do with modifying it, and yet another one that has to do with canceling it. So um, that could be split into, in this construct here, three separate user stories. You could also separate based on exceptions or cross-cutting concerns. For example, in the beginning, develop only one main path, like accept repayment for a loan. Then address exceptions, like what if a person um, overpays? Then um, come up with a user story that recognizes that and processes a refund and or gives the option of allocating the overpayment to a future payment or something like that. And then also um, um, adds on other concerns like the check access restrictions or record name of operator. So maybe, um, you know, when you're working on uh, accepting payments or processing refunds, it's going to check 
on um, who the operator is or track that so that if at a later time, you know, who is it that gave this uh, refund here? Well, you could look and see, you know, okay, the, the operator's name was recorded. Or maybe you put some restrictions so that maybe not everybody um, is allowed to do a refund. And so you would have levels of users that have different privileges. Okay, and then down at the bottom, split based on data boundaries. For an example, you know, as an accountant, one needs to enter balance sheet information, um, which could then be split into summary information and separately um, uh, receivable details, or you know, maybe you could have AP. You know, so you could have different portions of the overall um, balance sheet um, activities that need to be done. So enter AR, enter AP, etc. Make sense? So just to kind of uh, prompt you, give you some ideas about what to do um, in a Scrum project if you have the scenario arise where a user story is being estimated by the team and it won't fit into a sprint. It's too big. Now, when it comes to determining value for user stories, this is primarily owned by the uh, product owner, right? And it always comes back to money, but money, you know, the value can be looked at from different points of view. So new revenue, obviously, you know, getting new customers and having them buy stuff. Um, well, below that, there's another consideration, incremental revenue. Uh, so somebody's in the process of placing an order. Um, maybe there are some premium features that could be add-ons at that point in time um, or maybe added later on. So you have an existing customer who actually buys um, more of or enhanced parts of the existing thing they already purchased or are in the process of purchasing. Retained value. So this is... Um, you know, retaining customers so that they don't go to a competitor. And then the bottom one is operational efficiency. You know, how could things be done to speed up the process of whatever it is um, so that the cost of delivering uh, the product is reduced? So this then leads us to a discussion about priorities, recognizing that there are some priority concerns that come from both the customer domain as well as the technical domain. And there are some prioritization models. Um, if we look right here, there is value-based prioritization. And the hierarchy of that would be high value followed by high risk, followed by high value, and then low risk, followed by low value, and then low risk. So, you know, we might have written this a little bit differently, but that's value-based prioritization, and this is primarily the product owner with maybe some input from the team just simply deciding um, what he or she wants done most Listening to the team say, well, you know, there's some, you know, greater risks with this user story than that. And so you'd probably want to uh, persuade the product owner to take care of high risk stuff first um, because that would have an <clears throat> a, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, an impact on the future things that need to be done. There's the, the Cano model. Uh, which looks at each of the user stories and classifies them as being mandatory, linear, or exciters. And the mandatory items are those user stories that are musts. And they'll never move beyond, move the customer or the end user beyond neutral. It's if they're not there, it creates dissatisfaction. If the, the, you, the product owner and the team has done a good job in identifying what are the mandatory or threshold items, um, you would see that um, um, it just gets it to neutral. That's what's expected for the product. Linear items, um, user stories, are those user stories that as they are implemented 
progressively throughout the project and added to the feature set, it will linear increase customer satisfaction. And it can be, you know, in their absence, dissatisfaction all the way up to high implementation, creating a great deal of satisfaction for the customer. And then the third category is exciters and delighters. Um, and those are features or functions. Those are user stories that are not mandatory. And the absence of them will never result in satisfaction going below neutral. But by adding them, um, you could create excitement and delight for the customer. These would typically be things that are features that would be included in a premium version of the product or maybe add-ons that are promoted, you know, at the point of sale. You know, have you thought about this? Because it'll really help you or whatever. So that's the Cano model. And then there's Uyghur's relative weighting method. And um, this is all using numbers. So each feature is given a value for its benefit and it's penalty, given a value for penalty, meaning what's the pain if that feature or function is not included? And then there is um, um, the cost side and the risk side. And then those are all calculated together and that results in, excuse me, a ranking or a hierarchy which gives you the uh, priority for the uh, user stories. Um, we also talked about Moscow, didn't we? Did we talk about Moscow? Uh, Moscow is another prioritization model. Must, could, I said that differently. Must, should, could, won't. Moscow, M-S-C-W, must, should, could, won't. And we talked about that one. <clears throat> Thank you for that confirmation. Does it seem like a long time ago, or is it just me? I know it was just last weekend, but <laughs> it's like last year. Okay, so now let's talk about velocity. Um, uh, Priyanka, that is exactly right. Um, <clears throat> so velocity is the capacity of the team to complete work in a single iteration. So the team has estimated the user stories uh, for size or ideal days, and um, the sprints are going to be three week, weeks in duration. Obviously, not all user stories can be completed in a single sprint and be done with the project. Well, I guess maybe I shouldn't say obviously while I'm saying that. I'm thinking, well, maybe you had a very small, short duration project, so you could. But the point is, is that uh, it's the team's capacity to... Um, complete work in a given sprint, and it is an observation. It's not a prediction. So if we're working on sprint five and we're working on determining what our velocity is, then um, it would be the average of the previous four sprints. If there were any uh, outliers, you, you would uh, disregard those. Um, and so it's an observation. If we look over to question, or, uh, box number two here, velocity is used to deal with um, determining how many user stories we are going to include in a given sprint, and also how many sprints are we going to need to create a release or a set of user stories. And here's an example. In box number three, a team completed five user stories that were sized five, three, eight, 13, and two. Two user stories, each sized five, were left half complete. What is the velocity of the team? And the answer is either going to be 31 or 36. 31 is the sum of the completed user stories. Um, if you were 36, you were claiming half of the two that were five. 
so that would be a total of 10. So you claim half of it, which would be five, would take you to 36. But it's not going to be 36 because the only thing that counts towards progress is working software. So even if the team had finished nine out of 10 story points for a user story, meaning it's almost done and then the sprint ends, that doesn't get counted towards velocity. And you don't mess around with velocity. Um, you can mess around with your estimating and you can mess around with um, you know what user stories are going to be completed in a sprint, but you don't the, the velocity is not variable. It is what it is based on past performance. When it comes to levels of planning, we have what's called the planning onion. And let me walk you through this here. <clears throat> Up at the, the broadest area is the vision level. So the vision level, that's the suits, right? They're the ones that have the strategy and objectives for the company and where it's going. And so they have that overall big vision for the uh, company, which is likely going to include products. And each product should have a roadmap. My example of that website that I'm uh, working on has uh, three versions um, which make up the product roadmap. Version one is the free site, version two is the membership site, and version three is the, um, uh, the pay referral commissions uh, uh, version of the site. And the product roadmap is then supported by releases. So for my project, I have three releases. So all of the user stories needed for the free version are in release one. All of the additional user stories that are needed for the um, uh, paid version, the subscriber version, uh, and then also for version three, those are all releases, three releases. And then for each sprint, we will be pulling user stories from the release that we're working on. A release is likely going to take multiple sprints. And, um, and then the sprints are populated by the individual user stories, which are then disaggregated into tasks. And we do the, excuse me, the daily scrum, which is the daily level of planning and coordination. So we call that the planning onion. We already kind of talked about the release and roadmap um, concept here. So let's just review this quickly. Um, prioritize high level epics and determine goals and releases. So we'll use epics and themes in order to group things together. You know, what should be included in what's released? So what are the goals for the releases? Then the first bullet point, establish goals of release based on market demand, regulatory needs, or customer expectations. For each release, you want to estimate the target stories, repeat until the target stories are assigned an iteration length. I should, that's, it's blending some things here. Um, be able to estimate velocity and then uh, assign stories to the sprints. So we keep estimating the user stories and we keep organizing uh, that until we can do that. We can come up with an iteration length or sprint length and then figure out what our velocity for each sprint is and then uh, assign stories to the, uh, the sprints. Uh, the, the next bullet down, iterate until the user stories and release date meets conditions of satisfaction. So that's uh, definition of done or acceptance for the release and try not to pack too much into a release backlog. So um, just like you would not want to pack too many user stories into a sprint, you want to have the timelines appropriate and uh, what are included in the uh, events uh, make sense. Okay, so here's a bit more about release planning on this slide here. Um, you've got the product backlog here on the left, and then we might come up with a release plan, which could be flipped and could be looked at uh, horizontally. And you probably plan um, about three releases in advance. 
um, or at least you're doing more of the detailed planning on that. Uh, because things are going to emerge when we do, you know, sprint one that's going to help in sprint two and things that happen in sprints one and two that are going to help um, release three. And then you've got, um, you know, your subsequent releases where we're just doing very high level planning. It's called rolling wave planning, where we do detailed planning for things in the future in tandem with doing high level planning for things in uh, the future. Did I say that right? Detailed planning for things in the near term in tandem with high-level planning for things in the future. Um, and we talked about deciding as late as possible, I believe, meaning that it's better to actually plan the later uh, releases <clears throat> uh, for purposes of um, making sure we have more information, uh, the most information available. Okay, so estimation. Let's start at the top left. The principles behind estimation understand the cone of uncertainty, which is an estimate or best guess to begin with and then progressively becomes more accurate. In fact, let's just take a break and look at the cone of uncertainty. So at the very beginning of a project, there's going to be a high level of uncertainty. Um, if I were to draw this chart, I would make it a little bit more like this. So clearly you're going to de-risk the project as early as you can and then eventually all risk disappears when the project is done. Risk is uncertainty. Okay, below that the only estimate that matters is the one given by the team supported by this uh, comment here, nothing is impossible for the one who doesn't have to do it. So the product owner is like, King, come on, you can do this. The team's like, no, we know what our velocity is. No, the product owner says, I'm telling you, I, there's no way that that can't be done. I know you can do it. I trust you. I believe in you. <laughs> but the product owner doesn't have to do, have to do the work. Okay, top right, overestimation and underestimation is always going to be an issue that we deal with. It's more likely that we will underestimate than overestimate. And by looking at our velocity from iteration or sprint to sprint, um, there could be some information that is um, showing us that we're underestimating, for example, meaning um, we're thinking we, you know, the user stories are smaller than they are and that we can get, you know, a certain number done in a sprint and then there's a fail. Well, that would mean then that would be discussed during the retrospective and then we would do something different going forward, which might include doing some re-estimating. Scrum estimating is not necessarily more difficult. However, Scrum exposes bad estimates sooner, which is a good thing. When we were doing our um, uh, planning poker, you could see that um, the first time as a team, you know, we didn't know each other. We didn't know everybody's thoughts and concerns. And those kinds of things, you know, get shared and absorbed as a project goes on. And so there's a higher awareness of that. So um, what we would say is that um, using estimation techniques, scrum estimation techniques might be um, more inaccurate at the beginning of a project, but they will quickly become very accurate as the um, project advances forward. <clears throat> Let's see, is there a question here? Can velocity be increased over a period of time for the project? Yes, it can. Now, it's not that it can it will increase if the team is learning how to work together better and better. You would expect that if I can just use my mouse here, if we were tracking velocity, so this would be um points completed over here. Uh let me just do PTS for points. And down here is time.
and we go from sprint to sprint, right? You would expect that maybe, you know, the first couple of sprints, the team would be learning how to work together and there would be a steep curve and then it would kind of flatten out and maybe have, you know, a slow rise going forward as the team emerges as a high performing team. They get better at their cross uh, functional behavior. You know, somebody's sick, the team just keeps chugging along. Um, other things, you know, just, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> there, I had bumped the thing on my screen there. Um, <clears throat> um, so the team, you know, learns how to work better together. And, you know, their estimates become more accurate, et cetera. And you would expect a high, a high performing team to have a uh, a result like this for velocity where there's quick improvement and then it kind of stabilizes and then begins to tick upwards. Okay, we talked about the cone of uncertainty. Let's talk about ideal time. Um, when we do estimating for user stories, um, we do it in ideal days. When we do estimating for tasks, we do it in ideal time, which means hours. I think that's on the whiteboard or it was on the whiteboard. Oh, it was on it. Um, so ideal time is the amount of time it takes to complete a piece of work. But that's based on the notion that the team member or members are available to do just the work with no distractions or anything at all. So assuming that um, Priyanka could sit down at a keyboard and code for eight hours without taking a break for lunch, no phone calls, no discussions, no meetings of any kind, just work eight hours, how much could be done in that eight hours by Priyanka? That's what ideal time is. But the thing of it is, is that there is no such thing as somebody being able to spend every minute of every day only doing work. There will be um, distractions. So it has to be converted into elapsed time. Now, we don't convert it to elapsed time at the user story level, but we do convert it to elapsed time when we are dealing at the task level. And what that looks like is, you know, for each team member, you're going to have to do it separately because some team members have more distractions than others. Some might have other duties that pull them away. Um, whatever the case may be, um, you determine how much time in a given day a team member is available to do work. So say it's five hours out of eight for one. Maybe it's six hours out of eight for another. Maybe it's four out of eight, but you figure out what it is, and then you take the average, and that average availability is used then to convert ideal time into elapsed time. Um, I should have circled this box here because we talked about this as well. Um, and then I already mentioned this here, only considers actual work time, not the distractions. So that's the concept of ideal time. When it comes to story points, it's different than that. They are a measure of size relative to each other. So we were doing planning poker this morning where um, we were looking at grapes versus apples, and then we were looking at oranges and, and what else do we have? Watermelons and coconuts. And we weren't trying to figure out how much time it would take to eat grapes as opposed to how much time it would uh, take to eat a coconut. It's clear that it's going to take longer to eat a coconut because there's more effort involved. So we have a sense that it's going to take more time. But comparing the coconut to our baseline of two, right, we came up with a baseline of two for the smallest user story. We compare eating coconuts to that baseline and we say, okay, you know what, it's going to take more effort to uh, eat the coconut than it is to eat uh, grapes or apples. <clears throat> Um, so you can do it like we did. You can also triangulate. 
Um, for example, when we did our planning project this morning, or this morning for me, rather, at the beginning. Um, oh, that's not it. That is the daily stand-up. Here it is. If I had said, team, I want you to pick a small user story, a medium user story, and a large user story. Um, and then we would then compare other stories to those three, and so we would kind of triangulate on it. Um, let's say that we did, uh, you know, two was small. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. Grapes was small, apples were medium, and coconuts were large. Well, if we then looked at orange and we said, well, you know, orange is um, smaller than apples but bigger than grapes. So we would know this would fit in between grapes and apples. Um, and so let's say, you know, we had apples at five and grapes at two, then we would say an orange is probably going to be three. And the values, you know, now I used um, in our example the modified Fibonacci series. Uh, what we do in Scrum and Agile, if we're using story points, we're going to use um, a nonlinear scale for the values. So down at the bottom, here there's the modified Fibonacci sequence. The way the Fibonacci sequence works, by the way, um, um, it's the the value is the sum of the two on the right. So let me break this right here because this is a modified Fibonacci. So 13 is 5 plus 8. 8 is 3 plus 5. 5 is 2 plus 3 and 3 is 1 plus 2. If we were doing the real Fibonacci series, this wouldn't be 20. It would be 13 plus 8, which would be 21. Um, I, I don't know why some use modified Fibonacci and others not, but that's just kind of a common thing to do. If you're doing planning poker, you give everybody seven cards, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, and 20. Um, another nonlinear scale is doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16. Um, you typically don't go too far to the left with the values because um, that either means that you're being too granular or you've got stories that are probably too big and they need to be disaggregated. Now, somebody just chatted here. Um, should some buffer time be included in the actual estimates? Um, <clears throat> let me answer that question first by going back to ideal time, and then I'm going to come back to story points and answer the question. When we're estimating in ideal time, we don't add a special amount of time that we would call a buffer. We just allow for the distractions and the interruptions, which could look like a buffer, right? You're saying, you know, um, you know, Priyanka, if um, based on your duties in the organization and our uh, workday of eight hours, you're typically available to be doing your project work five out of those eight hours. So when we are converting ideal time to elapsed time, um, you know, we will be building in extra time based on distractions and interruptions. We would not call it a buffer, but that's essentially what we're doing. Now, when it comes to user stories that we're using story points, it is different. Um, the points are for the entire amount of the work. And why might we need to have some extra time for a user story? Well, it's likely going to be driven by uncertainty. There might be other uh, things that impact it, but that's the main thing. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, team. So when the team is estimating the size of the user story, they will be including in their discussion and estimates any extra time or buffer time that would be needed for uh, that user story to be completed. So do we accommodate um, uncertainty when we're using story points? Yes, we're looking at the, the X factor. And if we've got an unstable user story, then we're probably going to um, say, you know, this is going to be a bigger user story than one that's similar but has a, a much lesser level of uncertainty. Um, so that's the story points. Let's compare the two. 
Um, ideal time uses things like hours and days, which is easier to explain outside the team, right? The suits like things in days and hours. Everybody's estimate may be different, not a bad thing. It's easier to do at the beginning because we're oriented to think about time. Um, and it does kind of shine a light on wasted time. Story points um, are harder to explain outside the team. Um, you know, the suit says, well, um, how long is it going to take to do user story 301? And our answer is, um, well, that's a 10 user story point user story. And the suit's saying, what does that mean? Tell me how long <laughs> it's going to take. Um, so the suits have to be converted to uh, uh, story points. Now, here's the thing. It's a lot easier to get consensus when we're estimating in story points. And once we get good at it, it's going to be much faster. We have to remember it's not comparable across teams. So, you know, a team working together will have its own kind of system for sizing the stories. And another team that might even be working on the same project will have a whole, a whole different uh, scheme. And so if the velocity of one team is 25 and the velocity of another is 50, it doesn't mean that the team with the velocity of 50 is able to do more work than the teams whose velocity is 25. And we did, um, when we got our day going, um, we started with um, uh, a planning poker exercise. And so, you know, we used all of the team members. So we selected the team. The product owner was there to answer any questions. Um, the team discussed each of the story cards and then um, decided what their vote was going to be. And then everybody voted at once. If there were outliers, they were discussed. And um, the reasons for that, uh, those variances, those outliers, um, were then part of the discussion. And then we did another round of voting. And we would keep doing that until we had our estimates converge or we reached consensus on them. Okay, so advantages of planning poker. It's fun. It's quick. It gets the whole team involved. The, the team understands... Um, a little bit about all of the stories. Everybody contributes his or her expertise, and the discussion during the estimation provides clarity in the direction approach and even a bit of design. If we were in the same room team and we were doing a planning poker activity like we did uh, at the beginning of our day uh, together, um, we would be able to, you know, model it a little bit better. Or if we tried to unmute everybody, but you could hear the background noise. I've tried doing it. It doesn't really work. But you get the idea that if the team's discussing and things like that, you would actually get to the point where um, your estimates would converge and the team would say, okay, this user story size is, you know, whatever it is. Okay, so we need to wrap things up for the day. So we are ending right here. And that means tomorrow when we get together, we're going to be doing slide 20. You're starting with that, which is affinity estimating. And let's see, affinity estimating, we go through that. We're going to talk about tracking progress using um, information radiators. And then we're going to talk about what we do when we find variances between the plan and the actual results. And then we'll have our quiz. So we're almost finished. Um, I think we're good on time. And if you are interested in Agile Scrum certification, consider exploring Certified Scrum Master CSM certification training course. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. Now let us look at a typical scenario of an organization where the need of user stories would come in. So looking at this scenario, so an organization would have a scenario where uh, the existing products are sold very well in the market and uh, they may think about introducing new product or they may think about introducing a new feature or functionality to the existing product. So the scenario what we are considering is it says our previous products sold really well in the market. Now let's think about new products. So we'll need to make sure we can understand the requirements and fulfill the requirements. Now, how do you do this? So how are you going to understand the consumer requirements, user requirements, and how is that going to help the user to accomplish the requirement and fulfill the need, whatever it's required to be fulfilled. So user story helps. 
one who understand the user stories would look at the perspective of the users and these user stories provides those insight towards what user would exist so as we go through we will understand in the perspective of the users the requirements and how user stories helps in terms of fulfilling those requirements this requires a certain amount of visualization let us see what it is so what are user stories user stories are an agile software development project management tool that provides users with simple natural language explanations of one or more features written from the end users perspectives so for a given product we may have many end users so we may develop an application within an organization and use that application for an organization that is one scenario second scenario is we create a product we sell it and employees of our customer organization will become users of those products these are the two scenarios so having this scenarios what kind of product it is what is the objective of this product which is going to fulfill so let me assume an hr application which is used for submission of claims from the employees so what is that requirement so this application should accept the claims submission from the employees of the organization and then that needs to be processed and the claims needs to be uh, cleared now what will happen now the user community if you visualize there is an user as an employee of an organization who submit claims so there is an user in the finance perspective who is going to deposit the money similarly there is an user who is going to approve so many such user interfaces we will see the existence of the roles of users we will see who would be using these particular applications so in their perspective there should be an interface provided there should be some privileges provided through which they would do their transactions and activities when we write the user stories we don't write them in detail so a user story doesn't go in detail it just mentions how a certain type of work will bring value to end user so what is this role specific end user would be doing at that particular role in this particular product what is the transactions involved so the end user in this case could mean external end user or even internal customer or colleagues within the organization so looking at these points if i look at the same application hr claim processing application who are this internal users the employees of organization so who are these external maybe the people who sold this particular application to our organization so they have installed it they manage it there is an administration role for this particular product that is a role similarly uh, another set of uh, internal users maybe someone who is like from finance from hr so in each of these roles perspective this particular product should provide the interface and then there should be a transaction in their perspective which is very important so user story should explain this in very brief so that it helps in terms of visualizing what kind of interface has to be provided and why would this particular role use it that is very important so user stories also form the building block of agile frameworks like epics and initiatives so what is this epics what is this initiatives let us look at it now epics refers to the group of user stories where the large amount of work broken down into user stories so many user stories together forms epics which will provide certain insight towards how these user stories are connected with each other so similarly initiative refers to combination of multiple epics forming that initiatives so which is very essential to group so managing perspective it will become easy and also looking at the objective what is that particular group of user stories group of epics are going to accomplish so user stories can also help ensuring that team work to goals of the organization through epics and initiatives it should be looking at that objective exactly what is the directions we are getting into and how these combination of user stories so as an employee i am submitting my claims so what is that required in that user's perspective there should be a story so i as a finance person i am going to clear these claims i am going to pay the money deposit the money so that is need that particular role need certain interfaces and that visualization requires how this interactions happens so user story should help in terms of understanding those so the requirements for making user story a reality are added later after discussing with the team so uh, we made a user story we created a user story it doesn't end there 
So there needs to be a discussion which happens further to decide, yes, it is a valid user story. So this will also help in terms of prioritization, which needs to be taken up first. So user stories are recorded on post-it, notes, or an index card, or a project management software. And this would help in terms of prioritization or for tracking as well. So what is the advantages of user stories? So advantages of user story involves, it helps in delivering high quality content because what is required to be accomplished in the user perspective, that will be very clear. Eases collaboration with team members because finalization on the user stories and understanding of the user requirements would happen after discussing with the team members. Each one would give their own uh, viewpoints and uh, prioritization of particular user story or keeping a specific user story or not considering that user story would be based on the feedback which team provides. This cannot happen in terms of uh, having team members together and speaking about it. Helps understanding users better. So user roles are discussed, users requirement is discussed and what is that go they are going to accomplish through this user uh, interface that is also discussed. So user role is understood, user requirement is clearly understood by writing a user story. This will also help in improving transparency because since the collaboration is happening, since the user story is not just taken just like that, the discussion happens and that will have an inter interaction and collaboration. So definitely improves transparency. So now it reduces risks. So when I say risk, it's obviously uncertainty. So it reduces risk because the clarity one would have about the requirement of users. So accordingly, the features functionality of the product are defined so that they can fulfill those user requirements. Then supports iterative developments. As I mentioned earlier, the collaboration, the transparency, everyone working together. And in the agile perspective, user stories, epics and initiatives gets into the specific iterations only after this discussion with the team members and after prioritizing it. So the user story will be there in the product backlogs, which will be prioritized based on that particular scenario of requirement in agile scenario so as uh, when we say agile it's quite obvious we need to be flexible to the changing scenarios so since we're working together and when we go for an iterative mode of uh, approach it is quite obvious we're going for it to get adopting to the changing scenario so that we can select that particular features functionality by pulling that particular epic or user story as a priority in the given list so that prioritization making will also become easier focuses on OCL communications means lot of interactions happens while discussing on user stories so since people are doing it OCLI so there is some personal touch also established could collaboration can get established so user story also provides that visibility because of that people working together in a collaborative manner invest in user stories so what is invest so investing in user stories so what does that mean so it is a concept that helps creating meaningful user stories. So it, it stands for independent, negotiable, valuable, esteemable, sized appropriately, testable. So when I say independent, so whenever we write the user story, that should be self-contained, if at all possible, to avoid dependencies on other user stories. So it should be independent of one another so that each of them can be developed and delivered separately. So negotiable, so when we say negotiable, user stories can always be changed or rewritten. So at any given point in time, so we should be able to do that modifications required. So that should support the flexibility associated with the agile methodologies. So since requirements often evolve, changes, and these changes comes for various different reasons. So how do we change these user stories or modify this so that it can fit into the requirement so that adaption can happen to the changing requirements. So stories should be discussable and should be open for negotiation for any change scenarios. So next valuable. When I say valuable, it's quite obvious. We're speaking about value, what is being created for the users or consumers. So a user story would represent the goal or an objective an end user who is going to look for means value is always in the consumer's perspective so now i created certain features functionalities fine but did that really create the value to the consumers 
So the value realization plays an important role. So stories must ensure there is a value being added to the consumers and customers or users always. Otherwise, user story doesn't make any sense. So estimable. So when we say estimable, one should always be able to estimate the size of the user story. So sometimes developers may not have the experience required to size the particular situations or needed for a user story. Reasons may be anything. It may be not having specific insight towards it or don't know how to estimate. There may be someone specific who needs to understand that scenarios and then come and discuss. Reasons may be anything. So stories, if you cannot estimate, then it will become difficult in terms of handling it better. So it should give some visualization. So it should be estimable and can be divided into tasks. So now small means sized appropriately. So user story should not be very big or should not be too small. And then uh, how do we decide on this size? So now when we say uh, any user story that can be completed by a developer in single iterations, then uh, can we call it as too big? Quite obviously that is again indicative. So user story should be subdivided into two or more small stories into multiple pieces, multiple stories, small, small stories so that it can be handled better. So story should not be too big and should be completed within 40 hours or three to four days. These numbers are indicative. So not necessarily you should be fixing with this number. So just an indicative to show you that what would be the focus when I say user story in what is that effort it would take to accomplish that. Now testable. So when we say user story is testable, one has to ensure that development is complete and has been done correctly. So means one, once you create a user story, so that needs to be articulated in such a way so that it becomes measurable. When I say testable, obviously there should be metrics, a target matrix which can be created, which will help me to state, yes, this particular requirement is accomplished. So they should have an acceptance criteria that can be tested to check if they fulfill the customer's need. So then how to write user story? This is very important uh, point to look at. So how to write the user story? So writing user stories comes up with a specific template with a simple language so what is it so now as a role i want to so that so you keep filling it so typically role means what the specific user role who would be using that particular product and their requirements which are being fulfilled so that is the role the name of the role we are going to put it here so the role refers to an individual that would be interfacing or interacting with the system now uh, want to when we say want to the want or action which represents the behavior of the systems so what is that it's supposed to do this action would be unique to each user stories now so that this refers to the benefits or results that non-functional and external to the system as a result what would happen what is that we are trying to accomplish out of it so let us look at an example how does it look like as a CEO, I want to track my subordinates progress to ensure organization's goals are met. Similarly, if we take the reference to those examples what we discussed earlier, like we took the example of HR portal, so claim processing requirement. Now this can be the same user story as an employee of an organization, what can I write? So as an employee of this organization, I want to submit my claims online so that Claim processing will become smoother, easier, faster without any errors. So that can also be a user story. So it gives certain visualization. What kind of users are there and what is that they need? So the moment you write the user stories, you should visualize that role. It is very important. So there is three C's of user stories, which we uh, call it as card, then uh, conversation and then confirmation. So when we say card, Card provides a written description of the user story. So what do I mean by written description of the user story? So same thing, the user story, what we just saw as an example. So that can be written on a card. So this will help in planning and estimating. So what, and that will also gives that visualization of users and their requirement so that that can be articulated further and also estimated so that it can uh, looked in the perspective of invest what is invest what we discussed so it is independent it is negotiable it is valuable it is estimable it is sized appropriately means it's not should not be too big too small the examples what we saw was appropriate 
and testable. So now when we see this particular user story, is it fulfilling all those points what we discussed in invest? That is very important. Now this card, whatever the description is provided, should elaborate on that very clearly. So then further what happens? Conversation. After the user story is written in a card and given and it is shared with uh, every individual who is participating in that conversation. So then there will be discussion. So conversation represents discussion between users, team, product owners. So this helps in terms of whatever the user story is written. Is it making sense? Is it in line with the user's expectation? And at the same time, whatever the understanding we have, maybe as a product owner or the team member, a developer, is my understanding correct? The user perspective, so whatever the user story is written, is that user story is speaking about the requirement which needs to be fulfilled as they require. So this helps to build a shared understanding between all those individuals so that there is no confusion further. So once people converse together, once the stakeholders converse together, then you will confirm confirmation. So this represents the condition that need to be satisfied to ensure that the story meets all requirements. So you are confirming. So all the stakeholders are agreeing to that. So firstly, to summarize this, three C's refers to card, conversation, confirmation. Card provides the user stories which actually represents, as we took an example, so which will capture that. So that it also fulfills the thought of invest. Then uh, conversation is required to understand what is this user story is speaking about. Is that a real requirement? So confirmation further in terms of confirmation from users as well as all the stakeholders before you go and develop or execute that. So what is life cycle of user story? So when we say life cycle, so we may require to understand a life cycle starts when you conceptualize, when you visualize, when you say this is what we may require to accomplish. So there should be conceiving, someone should conceive that idea. So it may be a, related to a problem, it may be related to a specific product uh, for an opportunity what is seen. So whatsoever the reason it is, there is a scenario where something is conceived. Trigger may be a problem, trigger may be some uh, issues what is being faced, trigger may be an opportunity what is seen. So then the initiative, the trigger which actually pushed towards creation of the requirements and user stories. So the life cycle of user stories starts from there. So how does it go? So it involves right from the point pending to to do, then discussion, then developing, confirming and then finished. So when I say pending, I'm basically saying user stories in their most basic forms where they are created after communicating with the user and the project team. These acts as the reminder for further discussion. So first level of understanding on user stories in the basic form. So which will help in terms of further discussion and taking a call on that. So, will there be a possibility that this user stories will be modified as we progress? Answer is yes and no, both. So, it may be modified, but discussion is further which goes on uh, from this basic understanding of that particular user story. So, further discussion is to elaborate on that, make sense out of it and confirm. So, then after discussion with the stakeholders, users stories that need to be addressed are decided and put into sprints. So, in between the point where we said pending to to do so in between this there is a lot of discussion so where decision is happening here so decided and put into sprints means there is a prioritization also which is happening so now discussion at this stage user confirms users confirms the requirement and acceptance criteria so acceptance criteria helps in terms of once you test that particular user story after executing you will check based on these acceptance criteria so that you can conclude the requirement is fulfilled. The end users are shown a preview of upcoming features so that they understand, yes, this is what we were expecting. They can provide their feedbacks, necessary feedbacks or insights, whatever is required to be provided. So then once the discussion is complete, the team would be able to design and implement features to fulfill user requirements. So once user concludes, yes, this is what we were expecting and there is a sign off during the discussion, then features are developed and implemented so that it can go to that product which can be used. So then 
After developing, confirming. So the end user confirms the user story. Features are confirmed to testing environments. Alpha versions and acceptance criteria are looked at before saying yes, it is confirmed. User is accepting. So that will happen as part of confirming means that features or functionality what was written in user story. So that specific users are using it and concluding or acknowledging yes, this is fulfilling our requirement and this is according to the acceptance criteria what we discussed and agreed. So that is very important. So we write a user story fine, but users are not agreeing to it. That is not a good scenario to be with. User should accept and confirm, then finished. So the user story is completed at this stage. For new requirements or new features, a new user story must be created. Any new features or new functionality I am required to add to this particular product, then I would write another user story and the same life cycle starts, continues. And this is not an ending thing. So as I keep modifying the features, as I add new features, add a, uh, as I look at uh, improving the performances, so I keep writing the user stories. Now one question keeps coming to me. So we write a user story while fulfilling the requirements. Fine, as a specific user, I want this. Easy to narrate that. So how are we going to look at a scenario where there is an improvement of something? So whenever we are going to discuss about improvement of something, it is quite obvious we need to look at it. What is that improvement user is looking at? Now when I am uh, submitting a particular uh, request or accessing something, it is taking some time. Means there is some delay. Now user experience can be enhanced by reducing that particular time. That is improvement. As a user, the user story, basic user story doesn't change. But in the performance perspective, you may require to visualize that. So problem statement has to come in accordingly, user story has to be articulated. Then once the user story is written, it is required to put the user story mapping. So user story mapping represents and arranges user stories that help with understanding the system's functionalities, the system's backlog, planning releases and providing value to the customers. So typically this involves arranging or organizing user stories based on the priority along the horizontal axis. So I will horizontally when you move, so I will say which one is the priority, which user stories are priority, first thing which I need to focus on. So vertical arrangements represents how in a given specific user story, how the activities perspective, task perspective, sub-task perspective, further down how it gets elaborated to improving the levels, how it goes forward. So now let us look at uh, an user story mapping with an example of, let me say net banking uh, services provided by a bank for account holders. When I say net banking service, it is quite obvious. Uh, it is also has to be provided through having a product uh, which banking application would use. So, but here we need to visualize the user's journey while accessing the net banking portal, viewing the account details, paying bills like utility bills, doing a lot of transactions within that uh, particular portal net banking access the moment they do, like generating statements or uh, transferring money to one of the beneficiaries, etc. So the, all these transactions, so what is being done? So in this user story map, let us see how does it look like. So few activities are considered here, like uh, logging into the account, means net banking portal will come in, then one would input their credentials and then they log in. Now that journey of the users in a specific activity, what they do is visualized. Now login to account in the sense obviously one has to go to that portal. So go to login page, then enter credentials, login ID and password. So once that login ID and password is entered, obviously there is a process engine which runs behind to provide the necessary access. Now if that credentials are not uh, working or if I don't remember it, reset password is an option immediately. Now as I go through further from this subtask, in all the uh, particular uh, columns which I have given you, as you go through this, as I deep dive into it further, it goes on. So until the person gets an access to the account and then start doing the transactions, it goes up to that level. So I can keep writing the subtask further. So manage account. So you would go to account page once you access it. 
then you'll select the specific account because you may have many different account types which is there with the bank you may be having one or many so in the scenario you have more than one obviously you will select that account and account details will be displayed to you so this user will not do but user will get that so we are visualizing that and further after account details are uh, displayed what user would do then further you would keep visualizing that so some of the transaction like generating statement transferring money so even for that the steps are written so going to statement page then selecting the account for which you need a statement then selecting the period from uh, when to when the statement one is requiring and then uh, further clicking on it and downloading that particular statement or choosing an options mentioning that uh, I need this in an email or I need an art copy of this. So similarly transferring money. So you will go to that specific page where you need to transfer the money. So you may have the beneficiary there in the list already added. If you have added earlier or newly you are adding a beneficiary. So there are various types of transfers like so international transfer you will have local domestic transfer you will have within a bank uh, accounts being within a same bank. Bank A to consumers. So from me if I am a consumer transferring money to another consumer of the same bank and vice versa that is one of the options second is a, a bank consumer having and transferring a money to some other bank account of someone else that is another scenario or uh, transferring money for my own account in another bank so various different scenarios you come across so then limitation or depending on what kind of uh, beneficiaries are these what is the limitations and how are you going to authenticate them so the moment i visualize a specific transaction and activities of user stories what are the things an user can do then i can keep writing mapping this to each of those uh, flow and see how the flow happens so this flow helps me to bring in all those features and functionality and also prioritizing them so can i say the beneficiary option would be the basic thing which uh, consumer would give i think initially if i go back when actual net banking features were provided by the bank the basic thing was just viewing the account that was the given statement download was given otherwise uh, there was no opportunity to transfer money there was no opportunity to do something beyond that so now as we see today the lot of flexibility has brought in with lot of new features functionalities in that net banking or mobile banking options so they evolve so as they evolve it is quite obvious we may require to keep adding those features functionality by writing the user stories this is how the enhancement happens so overall if you look at user story mapping helps in terms of understanding not just the user story of one transaction associated transaction in the user story what happens throughout the journey that would help so this will also support to understand uh, and visualize what needs to be created to ultimately give that access to the user so the end-to-end -end flow should be visualized and also needs to be prioritization and has to be looked at as well now what are the advantages of user story mapping so the advantages wise helps with prioritizing work as I explained in the example Similarly, the focus is on user value. The moment I click on web page www.abcbank.com, now the bank page will come. I will have an interface of login. I will go and click on login. Now, from the point I open a browser and input that URL and then click on login, and login page comes in. How long it takes? So, there are many things which is involved. The browser things are involved. The system from which the person is accessing is involved. So, removing that part. So, thinking that both of them are working well and what should be the response from the server where this particular website is hosted that experience needs to be looked at so that's how you look at user value in the transaction now once i put a credentials now how quickly the authentication happens what are the checks the bank portal does to ensure that the person who is logging in is, is a genuine user is it just a password is there any captcha codes is there any OTP sent or is there any secret code the person has to put in? So likewise, many things are involved while giving that experience to the user. So and today's user, if you just put in various different checks points, they understand because they are very educated. So why all those things like CAPTCHA or OTP scenarios came in? So these are came in because more and more informed the people has become, then their ability to hack also improved. So more and more levels added to ensure that only that genuine user will enter the user account. 
Similarly, when you visualize any product and user journey, in the user's interest, what are the things which is going to create value? That needs to be understood. So only that experience will help for the user to realize the benefit. Then roadblocks are highlighted. So as we visualize this journey, so this will tell me, so what would stop me to move forward? Is there any concerns? Is there any constraints? Like for example, if you want to activate a beneficiary, but for some limited period, you can only send the limited amount of money. Why is that done? By chance, if the beneficiary is added by that individual who is not a genuine user, so we are actually holding it. Right. So by the time that freezing time, whatever is given, so by the time the message goes to the actual consumer telling that there is a user activated like this, and if at all, if it is not a genuine user, obviously the person can call to the bank saying that this is not the uh, beneficiary which I have added. There is something which is not correct. So they are giving that space. So how did they visualize this has to be done? So as we looked at the journey of adding a beneficiary, it's quite obvious when beneficiary is added, if by chance someone who is not authorized adds it. So who is going to disbenefit? Obviously user will be disbenefited. So that blocks, that constraints are visualized. Similarly, in making or creating that features functionality, what should be the basic features or in the product should be ready. Only then I can add this feature. Even that will be visible, right? So roadblocks will be highlighted and that those will be made visible so that easy for you to move forward, prioritizing and ensuring that it goes in the flow required to accomplish that value. So then ensuring team unity because everyone will have a visualization, user stories and the mapping reads a lot of discussion, brings the people to have a common understanding. So obviously that unity, the collaboration would come in. Focus on constant improvement. So improvement is the key, whatever you do. You, you have just adopted a waterfall methodology, you have just adopted an agile, you write user stories, you write epics, you write, bring in that uh, various different methods to do something, whatever you do, whether there is a product or a service or a process or a specific uh, uh, transactions, task, reports, whatever we make. So all that should help in terms of identifying the opportunities for improvement and making that improvements. That is very important. Hey everyone, my name is Ishan and I welcome you all to this session. In this session, we will be talking about agile project management and several other things related to it. Before we begin, let's have a look at all the topics we will be covering today. First, we will see the basics of Agile project management. Then, we will check the relevance and principles of Agile project management. We will then see necessary steps to implement Agile methodology. Along with that, we shall also see different frameworks involved in the process. And finally, we shall see some companies that use Agile project management. So without any further ado, let's get started with what is Agile Project Management? Agile Project Management, as the name suggests, is a flexible approach to building a project. In Agile Project Management, the project is broken down into several stages or sprints. Agile does not work on the principle of delivering the final product at the end of the project. It works on delivering sections of a project or mini projects. The process of project management in the case of Agile is Agile based. So there won't be any central control of project manager as it was there in the traditional way of working. Before we move forth, let's have a look at the Agile development cycle. Agile methodologies consist of several small cycles or sprints. At the end of each stage, we get a mini project. There's a product backlog that explains new features, changes in the existing features and several other improvements in the project. Then we have a sprint backlog, which has a list of tasks that are to be completed during each sprint. The sprint consists of planning, designing, execution, testing and deployment stages. And at the end of each sprint, a mini project is delivered. With every sprint, new features are added to the product, which plays a significant role in the overall project growth. After all the sprints and early validation in the development, the final deliverable has a fewer chances of failure. Let's now have a look at some reasons why industries have started moving towards agile project management. The first reason is high product quality. When we talk about high product quality, we refer to the build of the product as per stakeholders demands. Testing is performed at short intervals of time wherever needed to ensure high quality of the product. Then another reason is customer satisfaction. Whatever is done in the project is known by the customer. The deliveries don't take longer durations as they used to take in the case of traditional ways. The changes may be provided by the customer in the execution phase of the project. Third reason is reduced risk. Since the project is divided into sprints, 
So if the risk affects one sprint, it doesn't mean whole of the project will be at risk. The process of risk analysis continues to take place with all the other processes. Another significant reason for agile project management is better and faster return on investment. The project is now developed in several sprints and each sprint has its own version. Therefore, the project becomes market ready after a few sprints only. Since the projects can now be released with ease and in shorter duration, this helps the organization to stay ahead in competition with respect to other organizations which have still not moved to agile methodology. Now we shall check the principles of agile project management. There are 10 principles for successful agile project management. The first principle is the satisfaction of the customer by delivering the project fast and with least number of errors. The next principle refers to decreasing the amount of time between the phase of planning and delivery. The third principle states that the team of managers and developers work together and increase the productivity of their work. The next principle states that the changes requested by the stakeholders can be taken into consideration and worked upon during the development phase as well. The fifth principle pays attention to the factor of coordination among the team members. Then the sixth principle refers to the process of monitoring and tracking the progress of the project at the end of each sprint and making amendments wherever needed. Moving on, the next principle states that there must be a feeling of trust and support towards the team to complete the project's objectives. The next principle emphasizes on face-to-face -face conversations with the development team. The face-to-face -face conversation helps in both solving problems and easy knowledge sharing. Then the ninth principle emphasizes on finding solutions and maximizing the amount of work done with simplicity. This ensures timely completion of tasks by all the team members. The last principle states that Scrum tools like Monday.com or Zoho Sprints must be used to simplify the complicated codes which further helps in saving time. We shall now see the steps in Agile project management. The goal of Agile methodology is to produce shorter development life cycles and more frequent product releases than traditional waterfall project management. So we will now check 6 steps in Agile project methodology. The first step in the process is project planning. Project planning includes feasibility study, development of scope, breaking the project into executable tasks or sprints, and then estimating the amount of time needed to complete those sprints. The second step is the step of roadmap creation. A roadmap is a plan of action that shows how a project shall evolve over time. A list of all the features that the final product should have is created and the steps to achieve those features are taken. The next important step is release planning. Since we are doing the project, keeping in mind the agile project methodology, the project will complete in sprints. That means there will be the release of features at the end of each cycle. And unlike the traditional waterfall model, the development cycles will be smaller. The fourth step in agile project management is sprint planning. The sprints are made keeping in mind what all is to be accomplished in that particular step. At the beginning of each sprint, the goal of that sprint is decided and steps to achieve that goal are taken. The next step in the process emphasizes on daily meetings. There are short meetings every day to discuss if the team was able to finish the task for each sprint and check if there are any amendments that are required. Each team member talks about what they achieved in the last sprint and what are they going to work on in the next sprint. The last step is the step of sprint review and retrospective. There are two meetings after each sprint. First meeting is for the sprint review. This meeting is with the stakeholders to show them the finished product. This helps both sides to build a relationship and discuss if there are any issues in the end product. The second meeting is for having a sprint retrospective. This meeting involves the stakeholders to discuss what went well and what went wrong during the sprint. Sprint retrospective takes place after the sprint review and before the next sprint planning. Now when we know the steps needed for Agile project methodology, we must understand some Agile project management frameworks. There are several frameworks available today. Here, we will be discussing some of the most popular frameworks. The first framework we will discuss is the Kanban framework. Kanban framework is a well-known framework for implementing Agile software development. In the case of Kanban framework, work items are represented on the Kanban board which helps all the team members to see the state of every piece of work at any time. Kanban board not only helps in visualizing the work, but also optimizing the workflow among the team. The next framework we will discuss today is the Scrum framework. Scrum framework is a popular framework for managing complex knowledge work like in the field of research and advanced technologies. 
Scrum is a simple framework that helps team work together and learn through their experiences gained while working on a problem. The third framework we will see today is the hybrid framework. The hybrid framework is a combination of agile methodology and non-agile methodology. In the case of a hybrid framework, planning is done using the traditional way of project management, while the execution and delivery is done using the agile methodology. Since the hybrid is a combination of the two, it handles the requirement changes and delivers the product in different stages. The fourth and the last framework we will see is the lean framework. The lean framework works on the principle of providing maximum customer value and creating zero waste. It focuses on optimizing the flow of products all through the value stream. This helps in eliminating waste all through the process and create processes that requires less human efforts. This also simplifies the process of information management and makes it more accurate. Finally, let's have a look at some companies that have opted for agile project management. Today, around 22% of the organizations worldwide have all their teams working on the principle of Agile project methodology. Let's have a look at some of the most prominent companies in the world that use Agile project management. In the list, we have IBM, Cisco, AT&T, Microsoft, Philips and Samsung. And If you are interested in Agile Scrum certification, consider exploring Certified Scrum Master CSM certification training course. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. I am CMR, Chandra MR, a certified professional in ITL V3 expert, ITL4 managing professional, PMP, Prince2 practitioner, Prince2 agile practitioner, agile scrum master, DevOps and COVID-5. So as part of this tutorial, we are going to understand the typical interview questions which would come across when someone faces the interview for any of the roles in the scrum so question number one what is scrum so scrum is a framework that enables team to work together so with scrum teams can learn from experiences self-organize working on problems to reflect on their victories and their losses to improve so this is a simple framework which will provide a better ability and methodology one can able to handle it better. So Scrum is very well defined, articulated and this provides a better insights and capabilities building access is very easier and roles are well defined. So define the roles in Scrum. So what are the typical roles we come across in Scrum? So one of the roles we come across is product owner. So product owner is primarily responsible for maximizing the ROI by determining the product features prioritizing it into a list, what needs to be focused on for the next sprint and constantly reprioritizing and refining it. So what happens is whenever we may require to deliver, it is very important for us to have the requirements clear, what requirements needs to be fulfilled. To fulfill that requirements, the products what is produced should have specific features and functionalities. So product owner will have the list of features and functionalities which needs to be created when product comes out as a result of a project. So product owner owns this primary responsible to ensure these list of features are identified and those are prioritized as required. So next role we can think of a scrum master who helps teams learn and apply scrum to obtain business value. So scrum master helps removing impediments Impediment is anything which can stop things to flow smoothly. So protects them from interface and helps the team to adopt agile practices. Now Scrum is one of the methodologies for agile uh, approaches and practices. Now remember the term agile itself is not a practice. It, it refers to indicate that move faster, become flexible, respond to change, be flexible. Now Scrum methodology especially scrum master should understand this dynamics and ensure the team understands this and scrum master should guide the team to adopt these methodologies and ensure the results are accomplished accordingly. So next role is scrum team. So scrum team is a group of individuals who work together to deliver the requirements of the stakeholders. So scrum team is generally of the size like 5 plus or minus 2 who are self-organizing. So various different capabilities the scrum team members would have. 
So each of their capabilities complement to accomplish the results required. So question number three, what are the responsibilities of the scrum team? So scrum team is self-organizing as I mentioned earlier. So it is a self-organizing team that has five to seven members and the responsibilities would include the development and delivery of working products during each sprint. Now we are seeing the new terminology sprint. So what is the meaning of the sprint? Now sprint refers to an iteration, a time boxed iteration which will have a specific deliverables to be accomplished as part of it. So self-organizing team takes that specific working piece, what needs to be delivered. So that is a, a sprint backlog we call it as. So from the product backlog, the features functionalities which needs to be delivered as part of this specific iteration called sprint time boxed iteration and those sprint backlog items are delivered. The output of the sprint would be the features what is being taken as a working piece, working product. So to demonstrate ownership and transparency for work assigned to them. So they own it, the entire thing assigned to them, there, is, there should be ownership. So ensuring the success of daily scrum meeting by providing crisp and correct information. So scrum has one uh, event, there are five events basically. So one of the events which happens daily is daily scrum meeting where the team comes up with uh, scrum master. So they would speak about what is that they have accomplished uh, from the previous uh, stand up to till now. Is there anything which is stopping them to move forward? So giving the crisp updates, specific summary updates so that Scrum Master understands the status. So any specific uh, uh, changes or any specific support which are required, Scrum Master would discuss separately with those individuals and get it done. So it should be minimum 15 minutes meeting when we say daily stand up meeting. So Scrum team collaborate with each of the team members, they work together and they self organize. So next question, the differentiate between Agile and Scrum. Now it is very essential to understand the terminology's differences. So if we just end up with uh, looking at uh, uh, wrong understanding of each of the terminologies, then explaining will become difficult. So what does it mean by Agile and what it is when it comes to the terminology called Scrum? The term Agile refers to ability to move quickly and easily by becoming more flexible and adaptable. This is what the meaning which gets associated with the term Agile. So many times I have seen people answering Agile is a methodology, Agile is an iterative and increment methodology. And also I think uh, when you search through the popular search engines, you may come across that, which is wrong. So Agile is the terminology which is used to state to move quickly and easily by becoming more flexible and adaptable. This we should keep in mind. So if the our question may be like, what are Agile methodologies? Then you can come across like one of the agile methodologies is Scrum and you can go on on various different methodologies what we have. So Scrum is an agile methodology. Right? The term Scrum is the name given to the agile methodology which enables organization to become agile. Right? So to become agile, obviously there are various methodologies. Scrum is very popular. So that is the main difference. So further if you look at Agile Manifesto and 12 principles which acts as guidelines to become Agile. So there is something called Agile Manifesto, four points, clearly articulates what needs to be focused on to become Agile and that support that is supported through the 12 principles which guides. So Scrum is used in projects where requirements are constantly changing means I want to become Agile so I adopt Scrum. So this definitely has to align to Agile Manifesto and take the guidelines, whatever is mentioned in 12 principles of Agile Manifesto. Then looking at leadership perspective, roles perspective. So Manifesto mentions the required collaboration and interactions to become Agile. Whereas Scrum defines the roles like the Scrum Master, the Product Owner, the Self-Organizing Teams, which is cross-functional self-organizing team. So these are the main three roles which Scrum defines. Now generally when we say projects, we come across the role like Project Manager. So do we see uh, the, such project managers in Scrum? Answer is no. Because the Scrum Master who engages with the team regularly, more than management, they focus on doing facilitating role to the Scrum teams so that things can be delivered the way it is required and more flexibility is given to the team to take the calls to accomplish the results. So Scrum Master facilitates. Whereas the product owner, as I mentioned earlier, looks at the product backlog and prioritizes and provides what are the features functionalities 
needs to be created in the next iterations. So speaking about flexibility, definitely Agile Manifesto mentions the required focus on working software and focusing on changes. So that, that's the focus, the direction, what it provides. So Scrum approaches enables teams to react to changes quickly. The Scrum methodology is made such a way the team understanding that can able to react and those changes and modifications are made visible to the team. So delivery perspective manifesto provides necessary guidelines on frequent delivery of product or software. So Scrum with time boxed iterations called sprints builds, delivers to the users regularly and upheld agile principles. That is very important. So delivery here is as per the user's requirement, as per the customer requirements because customer when we want to become a child, customer has to involve very closely, stakeholder has to collaborate. Without that you cannot become a child. So next point is about collaboration. Agile manifesto stresses on individual interactions and customer collaborations. So based on this, if you look at in the scrum, how are they demonstrating this? So there are various events which happens in scrum. So as I mentioned earlier, we have daily stand-up meetings and uh, other scrum events like sprint retrospective, uh, sprint reviews, daily stand-up meetings, which happens like sprint planning, which happens regularly. So it, it becomes a reason for collaboration and everyone to discuss and take the call. So question number five, what are the main artifacts of the scrum process? Now product backlog, so which consists of list of new features, changes, which are uh, looking, organization is looking for uh, to bring into the existing features, changes to the existing features, bug fixes, changes to the infrastructure and several other activities to ensure a particular outcome. So product backlog. So then we can speak about sprint backlog, a subset of product backlog. So the sprint backlog contains tasks that the team aims to complete to satisfy the sprint's goals. So set of product backlog things are taken, put into sprint backlog. And those are the features which are supposed to be produced as a result as part of that particular sprint. The team first identifies tasks from the product backlog that need to be delivered to achieve a goal. So these tasks are then added to the sprint backlog. So the team first identifies tasks from product backlog. As per the priorities, the list which is prioritized in the product backlog, that is taken, put into sprint backlog and then those are delivered. So next you can think about uh, product increment. The product increment is the combination of all product backlog tasks completed in the sprint and the value of the increments of previous sprints. The outcome should be in the usable condition even if the product owner doesn't decide to release it. It is very important each of the increments which comes out so needs to fulfill this. Now question number six, how are the product and sprint backlog different from one another product backlog versus sprint backlog let us see a few differences so product backlog is the list of items that needs to be completed for developing the product which is the list of all the features functionality consolidated one whereas sprint backlog is the list of items to be completed during each sprint which are taken from product backlog the backlog when it comes to product backlog the backlog is collected from the customer by product owner and assigned to the team whereas in sprint backlog the teams collect the backlog from the product owner and sets up the time frame for the sprint. So product backlog is specific to end goal ultimate objective whereas sprint backlog is specific to that sprint specific iteration called sprint in scrum. What is that we are going to produce as part of it. Product backlog is based on customer vision whereas sprint backlog will vary based on the product vision defined by product owner. So prioritize list you take from the product backlog. So product backlog is independent of sprint backlog whereas sprint backlog is dependent on product backlog. Reason you, we know already I explained. So this, this is the prioritized list of backlogs we take from product backlog and create this uh, specific product as part of sprint which become sprint backlog. So product backlog uh, refers to until the project is complete, the product owner maintains the product backlog. Whereas sprint backlog, when it comes to sprint backlog, each new sprints as backlogs added by the team as each sprints are initiated. So next question, who is the scrum master and what does he or she do? 
So a Scrum Master promotes and supports the adoption of Scrum in the team. Scrum Master helps everyone to understand the theory, practices, rules and values in the Scrum. So Scrum Master is playing the role of facilitation, enablement, right? So Scrum Master ensures the team follows Scrum values, principles and practices, removes blockages that may hamper the progress of the project, protects the team from being distracted, ensuring the team delivers value during every sprint. So next question, what happens in daily stand-up sessions? So daily stand-up sessions are the discussion which are done daily that takes place and are usually 15 minutes in duration. The objective is to understand what went well, what tasks are completed from the last stand-up session, what tasks are pending and the obstacles the team was facing. If at all any uh, specific task is not accomplished for certain reasons, so what are stopping them, stopping the team to accomplish that? That needs to be made visible. So that a separate meeting can be held to discuss on that and do the necessary corrections by taking proper actions. So the objective of this daily stand-up meeting is to understand the overall scope and status of the project. Further, individual discussion can be taken up after the daily stand-up sessions. As I mentioned earlier, if at all, if you find something is not accomplished as per the plan, now how do we ensure that is corrected? And why is it happening? Is there anything, any support is required by the team to uh, focus on that? So something like that can be checked down. Question number nine, what is Scrum Ban? So Scrum Ban is a development methodology that is a combination of Scrum and Kanban. So this can be used to meet the needs of the team that aims to minimize the batching of work and to adopt a pull-based system. So Kanban is called as pull-based system. So which actually uh, helps in terms of visualizing what work is in progress. And uh, since it is a visualized, visualized system, it is visible to everyone. So it works uh, in terms of making people become conscious to take that work and get it closed quickly. So it's also called pull system because work is pulled from that particular uh, list. So in this Kanban uh, approach or methodology or thought is applied in Scrum. We call it as Scrum Ban. So combination of this definitely helps in terms of making that entire uh, journey successful and supports the Scrum methodology. So Scrum Ban includes the structure of Scrum along with the flexibility and visualization of Kanban. So Scrum Ban is used by the teams that need to be structure of Scrum that has the structure of Scrum and the flexibility of a flow based method like Kanban. So question number 10, what is Sprint Zero and Spike? So the term Sprint Zero refers to the short amount of effort put for creation of vision, a rough skeleton of the product backlog. So now we do this whenever we need to understand certain things, how things looks like to get certain insights. So this also includes insight towards estimating the release of products. So you get some vision, it gets some clarity, right? So this sprint zero are required to create project skeleton alongside research spikes, keeping minimal design, develop a small number of stories completely, have low velocity and be lightweight. So speaking about this spike, so spike is set of activities used in extreme programming. I think uh, this was introduced there in extreme pro programming that is of, I mean, one of the agile methodologies. So involving research, design, investigation, making proof of concepts, etc. So the objective of Spike is to reduce the risk of technical approach by gaining knowledge which helps understanding requirements and to improve reliability. So more aware we are, more clarity we have, I think putting step further will become easier. So informed decisions you can take. So next question, what is Scrum of Scrums? Now Scrum of Scrums is a terminology used for scaled agile techniques, which is required to control and collaborate with multiple Scrum teams. So when will we come across uh, the need for collaborating between multiple Scrum teams? So these are the scenarios where organization has a complex structure, it's complex in nature where you may require to handle them uh, uh, together, all of them uh, together for accomplishing the common objective for business. Various scrum teams you would have. So scrum of scrum helps in terms of 
better collaboration and handle them easily or better way better control it is best used in the situations where teams are working together on complex assignments just visualizing the system various different deliverables which are not a simple deliverables which we can do with a simple scrum team instead we have uh, various different deliverables which needs to be made and dynamics are too complex so bigger projects then scrum of scrum approaches can be taken so scaling the agile methodology to that level so it is used to establish the required transparency collaboration adaptation adoption to the required scale to ensure the products can be developed and delivered so whatever the products are delivered whatever we consider to be delivered so those needs to focus on the business objectives which is very essential so what is user story mapping so user story mapping represents and arranges user stories that help with understanding the system's functionalities the system's backlog planning releases and providing value to the customers so first of all we write user stories to understand the required features functionality in the user perspective now if we map those user stories which user story link to other user story which functionality links to other functionality determining that will become easier so now uh, user story maps arranges user story based on the priority along the horizontal axis on the vertical axis they are represented based on increasing level of sophistications so this will help in terms of handling in a regular flow in a specific flow not regular flow specific flow so that things can be done in order with full clarity so question number 13 what happens in sprint retrospective so after the sprint review so sprint completes so sprint review happens the sprint retrospective is done so during this meeting the lessons learned what went well what mistakes we did what were the issues so is there any new way of doing things so all these are discussed so that these necessary corrections can be considered in the upcoming iterations the sprints so data from year is incorporated when planning the new sprint so the learning what you had you are going to collect it what went well what went wrong what was supposed to be the best approach and how did we approach it is there any other way of doing it so these are discussed and very essential to do it at the end of completion of each of the sprints review question number 14 what is empirical process control in scrum so empiricism refers to work based on facts experiences evidences observations and experimentation so empirical process control is established and followed in scrum ensuring project progress and project interpretation is based on facts of observation so actual facts and figure is very important any decisions what we make any uh, progression what we make should be always based on on ground facts and actual pictures we should not deviate from it so these rely on transparency observation and adaptation obviously when you are working on the data on ground reality so you are working on the actual one it is transparent it is on the observed data the mindset of the team and the shift required in the thought process and culture are very essential to accomplish the agility required by organization so mindset of the team is very essential and uh, adoption of process compliance to the process the culture the behavior obviously plays a very important role when you do something within the organization so the, that needs to be done as per the need which should complement to the business uh, objectives very important and that should be based on facts not on some uh, thoughts or assumptions or ideas so next question is what are some drawbacks of using scrum so scrum requires individuals who have experience without whom the project risks will have a risk of failure so one does not have a capability difficult scrum requires team to be collaborative and committed so qual people collaborating individuals collaborating itself is a big challenge in many organizations so bringing this into the place is very important when you want to adopt scrum so scrum requires teams to be collaborative and committed to ensure the required results they should work together and also they should collaborate with customers stakeholders the less experienced scrum master can cause the failure of the project 
so be careful scrum master is the one who is facilitator we should understand this who enable the scrum teams who ensure scrum teams goes the way we need them to work if scrum master doesn't understand this dynamics does not have the clarity on this obviously the e or she can not enable to team to become that if tasks are not well defined the project can have any inaccuracies scrum works better for smaller projects and would be difficult to scale to large complex projects that's where we were discussing on a uh, few questions before this scrum of scrum we were discussing about when it becomes a complex project which those needs to be handled together which will become complex so next question is what are the skills of a scrum master so a strong understanding of scrum and agile concept scrum master should have fine tuned organizational skills so when scrum master is working with the self organizing team with various different capabilities so unless the organization skills interpersonal skills if scrum master does not have working with them will become difficult so scrum master should be familiar with technology that the team uses basic understanding of that how it works the dynamics associated with that and scrum master should have an ability to coach and teach the team to follow scrum and its methodologies and very clear about the terminologies artifacts and all the events what happens so scrum master should have an ability to handle conflicts and resolve them quickly so conflict is a scenario which would happen for various different reason however when conflict occurs the scrum master should not shy away from it own it to resolve in the interest of the project whatever is being done it is very important scrum master has to be a servant leader so it is not like i am a specific manager or leader of certain kind and i am doing this with certain way no i am actually facilitating i am guiding i am showing certain direction to the organization so that so to the team when i say organization i'm speaking about scrum team so that they are enabled to take up the specific project and accomplish the results accordingly question number 17 how can discord be dealt within the scrum team now the root cause of the issue need to be identified and addressed complete ownership needs to be established when you deal with this and try to diffuse the disagreements so emphasizing on the focus area that complements the project so here when we take up any of the discussions any of the uh, uh, opportunities or any actions what we take everything should be revolving around objective of ultimate objective of whatever we are doing so when we need to resolve something when we get into the root causes always it helps to look at the actions in terms of eliminating those causes so once the causes are eliminated it is quite obvious you can able to deal with it and address it with easily with the right set of actions so emphasize on focus areas that complements the project in the sense that should be the ultimate direction not my individual interest not that individual interest i favor this person i favor that person that's not be the case so favoring this solution or favoring that solution i'm okay with this particular technology i'm very happy with this technology not such thoughts it is the direction what is said i should move things in that direction so to establish a common understanding and to guide the team to that direction performing continuous monitoring and providing complete visibility very very important so next question what is a user story so user stories are an agile software development project management tools it provides the team with simple natural language explanations of one or more features written from the end user's perspective Now, for example, I am a account holder in a bank. So, first, what is the facility a bank would give to um, account holders? There is ATM banking, there is net banking, there is mobile banking, and there is over the counter. Now, when bank is working on creating certain specific features or specific mobile app to the account holders, now what are the things user needs? That needs to be visualized. now if i say the role here is account holder as a account holder i want to download the statements of every month as a account holder i want to download the statements every month this is what my requirement is how will you facilitate this this will provide the insight towards how the bank 
uh, what are the features and functionalities and how these requirements are, can be fulfilled by the bank and what features functionality the particular mobile app should have so that account holder can download the statements. So user stories will provide that insights. What every users? So account holder is not just an user here. There are many users when it comes to mobile uh, app of a bank. We have uh, uh, people who ma monitor it, manage it, who develop it. So they need to have a clarity on what exactly they need and that needs to be written as part of user story that what features functionality can be easily determined out of it. So a user story does not go into detail. It just mentions as I gave an example, it just mentions how a certain type of work will bring value to the end user. The end user in this case could be an external end users or even internal customers or colleagues within the organization. So if I'm an organization, I produce an HR application, I create an HR application uh, for claim processing, which I don't have till today. So that is for internal users. In the bank example, I'm speaking about external customers. So user stories also form the building blocks of agile framework like epics and initiatives. These help ensure that the team work to the goals of the organization through epics and initiatives. So further, the requirements for making the user stories a reality are added later after discussing with the team. So to write a user story, the involvement of the team members are very essential. They should discuss and come out and agree, yes, this is the features functionality which should be there. User stories are recorded on post-it notes, index cards or project management software, whatever is feasible and whatever is available there. Next question, how are the user stories, epics and tasks different? So user stories provides the team with simple explanation of business requirements created from the end user perspective as we saw the few examples in the previous questions. Epics are the collection of related user stories. They are usually large and complex. So these epics are created with specific objectives in mind and user stories are grouped. So that will form an epic. Whereas task refers to the one which are used to track work. So they are used to further broken down from the user stories. So there's a smallest unit in the scrum used to track work. A person or a team or two people usually work on the tasks. So these tasks or these through this task, I think uh, the features functionality, what are required to be accomplished are done. So question number 20, what is sprint? Now, as I mentioned earlier in the question number four, so sprint is the terminology used in the scrum. I think we explained various different concepts as we went through. So sprint is the terminology is used in Scrum, which refers to time boxed iterations. So we understood what is this iterations in Scrum approaches when we are going through that. The creation of specific module or feature, which is part of a product, is done during the sprint. The duration of sprint varies between a week or two. So means it's a short duration. Simple few features functionalities are taken and created. So what is velocity? So velocity is the metric used in Scrum that is a measurement of the amount of work that is completed by team during the sprint. So this is helped to measure how, how things are moving, how faster they are moving. It refers to the number of user stories completed in single sprint. So this speaks about that speed so or velocity. Velocity, uh, how faster we are going, how slower we are going. This helps to vary the so variations we can do in that velocity uh, depending on what business need. So what are the responsibilities of a product owner? So product owner define the vision of the project. They anticipate the needs of the customer and to create appropriate user stories. So they don't write user stories as such. They definitely have a set of people who should get involved, the team, uh, to write the user stories. A lot of discussion has to happen, brainstorming has to happen to write user stories. But product owner is accountable. So product owner has to evaluate the progress of the project based on this backlog, what project or product owner has and has to be licensed for all product related questions. The team may have certain questions, the sprints as the sprint progresses, the scrum team may have certain questions, clarification relating to the user stories. Those needs to be clarified. What is burn up and burn down charts? So generally when we say chart, it is a graphical representation. So burn up chart is a tool that is used to track the amount of work that has been completed. So it is a bar chart. The amount of work completed 
the height of the bars keeps increasing in burn up chart based on what is completed which will show the total amount of work the need to be done for a sprint or a project so it is it is a bar chart where each of the bars keeps increasing in its height as number of things get delivered increases so burn down charts typically again a graphical representation a bar chart so what is pending to be delivered it shows that now initially we will have a bigger bar and as the project progresses the height of the bars reduces indicating what is that is pending for deliverables it is a representation of how fast the team is working through the user stories it helps you to understand that so it shows total effort against the amount of work for each iterations which is helpful for you to see to that what is pending to complete question 24 how is estimation in the scrum project done so the estimation of user stories is done based on its difficulty a particular scale in which which is used to assess the difficulty of user stories so you have to analyze how difficult or easy is that some of the uh, scales which are used like numeric sizing 1 to 10 t-shirt sizing like s ml xl fibnosis series or dog breeds based on their uh, value so many such approaches are taken what are some risks in scrum and how are they handled so first of all we should know what is risk so some types of risk in scrum are related to budget people sprint product knowledge and capability now when we say budget risk of uh, increase exceeding that allocated budget taking more uh, looking for more variations i estimated for x it is going like x plus delta x so can we control it we you need to look at that so you need to assess that risk when what possibilities the cost can escalate people related like team members need to be of appropriate skills and capabilities if they lack that obviously uh, difficult it's not about just skills and capabilities the culture the behavior the attitude the energy the synergy that collaboration what people will have then sprint related uh, in terms of duration and deliverables exceeding the duration addition of scope to that sprint in between so that challenges that difficulties so product uh, referring to user stories and epics having ill-defined user stories and epics not properly articulated there is no proper visualization when you look at that user story not understanding so no nobody is explaining it correctly so then uh, knowledge and capabilities so it is not just related to the people here it's a entire system everyone was who is involved with the specific resource with its capability it can be technology capabilities also so when i say risk it basically involves identification assessment analysis and defining risk response plans and implementing them now when i say assess assessing the risks should be qualitative as well as quantitative so depending on the impact and probability of a risk if it is a high impact risk obviously we are required to do both qualitative and quantitative if a simple one with a very less uh, impact you can take the call accordingly to what extent you may require to analyze and have the response plans for it so once you have implemented and defined and implemented the response plans quite obvious you should keep monitoring it and manage the risks now risk impacts and probabilities may vary as the project progresses so we may require to keep assessing the identified risk and keep identifying the new risks as you as we progress in the project so these are done on a continual basis right from starting of the project till completion the reason i told it is essential to understand that the impact of the risk is based on the proximity of actual occurrence of the risk now for example if you start uh, working on something nothing is delivered at the at the moment now if specific risk of peop, no, people not available or customer is not uh, involved initial stage very initial stage so risk impact is accordingly project would delay in entirety or uh, requirements not very clear it is delaying something of that sort of uh, impact you will have now as the project progresses almost like 50 percent of the project complete now the there is some uh, challenges or risk associated with issues are occurring related to customers involvement now you are mid of project so again you will have a different kind of impact 50% is delivered 
now uh, you need to progress because active involvement of stakeholders including customer is very important when you are becoming agile so when that is not happening as an example i am taking the involvement of customers the collaboration part of it if that is not happening now here the impact level is not equal to the impact level when you, when this happens in the starting of the project same type of risk what we are assessing so that is the reason each of the risks you should keep assessing uh, the identified one keep assessing as the project progresses and check on is there any new risk is introduced as the project is progressing so next question what are some popular tools used in scrum so these are the list so you can think of github zoho trello jira software yodix very uh, version one so now what i am saying is these are the tools technology tools so when we say tools we cannot just limit our thought to technology tools so what exactly this tool does what are the techniques used that we need to be very clear right the metrics what is measured and methodology of measuring it and what processes are used what steps are used so what needs to be used so unless we are clear relating to specific type of project usage of these tools may not make any sense you cannot even implement or customize this for the requirement what you are trying to accomplish so you be clear about it when you are selecting the tool so 27 how does scrum master track sprint progress so we have uh, various different events which happens in uh, scrum like uh, daily scrum meetings scrum retrospective scrum planning scrum review and checking on the defects which are escaped density of the defects burn down uh, sprint burn down velocity so so checking all of this uh, provides the better insight to scrum master so that tracking the progress of the sprint will become easier so and how to deal with the scope creep now before we understand the dealing with scope creep we need to understand what is scope creep so the term scope creep refers to the change which is uncontrolled and added without checking the impact on the constraints like scope time cost now what happens is you will be uh, uh, doing certain or uh, delivering certain features now you are forced or you are influenced or without your knowledge some additional things are put in place so which may impact later it may add value it may not add value later doesn't matter but it may lead in terms of uh, impact to your cost time and uh, uh, schedules which is unexplained and uh, that extra effort what you have put in extra cost what you have put in uh, will become like uh, uh, re not recognized by customers and you will not get anything paid for it so scope to avoid the scope creep to deal with it one has to ensure close monitoring of works being done on day-to-day -day basis because scope creep can happen through team members influencing inf team members are influenced by consumer because of that it may happen so understanding communicating the vision to the team for ensuring the alignment so the team is very sensitive about that changes what is happening then capturing reviewing the project requirements regularly against what is delivered to emphasize to the team and customer about the requirements signed off so that someone will not come and uh, influence you or uh, make that additional things to be delivered they need not push you Right, ensuring any change introduced to go through change control so no changes without any proper approval by the authorities so that only those what is required to be implemented is implemented and that is done formally through the formal change request so avoiding gold plating so it is a bit different thought process when we say gold plating so uh, we who are doing the projects are trying to add certain things into the scope to please the customer as an example doing something additional providing some additional features and functionality for which we are not paid so scope creep is not a terminology used for it but gold plating is the term used but however since it is an additional scoping so we are just added here so don't say that when the moment scope creep we says that is not gold plating gold plating has a different direction so just to explain you along with uh, scope creep what else would happen to where the additional uh, deliverables would come in which is gold plating so question 29 what is mvp and mmp which means minimum viable product and minimal marketing product so now minimum viable product is a concept of lean startup 
which stresses upon the impact of learning while performing product development. So this allows one to test and understand the idea by getting exposed to the initial version of the product for target customers and users. So to accomplish this, one has to collect all the required relevant data and learn from the collected data. So the thought behind MVP is to produce a product to provide access to the users and to observe how the product is used, perceived and understood. This will also provide more insight towards what the customers or users needs are. So when it comes to minimal marketable product, this refers to the description of the product which will have a minimal number of features that addresses the requirements of the users. The MMP would help also the organization reduce the time to market because you have the clarity what is that we may require to provide. Now question number 30 what does DOD means definition of done right. So DOD refers to the collection of deliverables which includes written codes, comments on coding, unit tests, integration testing, design documents, release notes, etc. This would add variable and demonstrable values to the project development. So DOD is very helpful to Scrum while identifying the deliverables to achieve the objectives of project for the stated reason above. So defining the steps required to deliver the iterations, the usage of appropriate tool like burn down to make the process more effective, ensuring on time feedback throughout the project life cycle, ensuring the walkthrough of the product backlog items are done and understood correctly. So then creation of checklists for product backlog item, ensuring the DOD is defined to become task oriented, involving the product owner for reviewing during the sprint and sprint retrospective. That is about DOD. The next question, how can a scrum master be a servant leader? It's a very important thing to understand. So what is the meaning of the servant leader? The term servant leader mainly stresses on service orientation, which a leader should demonstrate. So today we say every organization is service organization. Even an organization who is producing car, if there is no service orientation, they cannot sell. So more stresses on being service orientation. The scrum master needs to be a facilitator, a guide, a mentor, etc. This helps the team have increased involvement and empowerment. So now question number 32, how can one coordinate between multiple teams? So one of the most common approaches for this is Scrum of Scrums meeting. So where members representing each Scrum team discusses the progress, performance, issues, risk, etc. together. This is complex structure, what you're speaking about. The frequency of these meetings must be predefined, well articulated, well defined. Generally, Scrum master would represent the particular Scrum team. On behalf of that Scrum team, they would uh, go and represent the meeting, represent in the meeting. Besides having a chief scrum master whose responsible is coordination and collaboration among all scrums who facilitates these meetings. If you are interested in Agile Scrum certification, consider exploring Certified Scrum Master CSM certification training course. So hurry up and enroll now. Find the course link in the description box. So explain Agile in brief. If this is the question, what would be the typical answer? So the term agile refers to ability to move quickly and easily by becoming more flexible and adaptable. So most of the times I've seen people say whenever I ask the question, what is agile? They say agile is a methodology. The term agile itself is not a methodology. It actually refers to this flexibility, adaptability. So all those methodologies which are there defined for agile, for example, Scrum. So they have an approach towards to become agile and do the projects in an agile way. So this requires adoption and adoption of continual changing scenarios in modern dynamic business environment, which means the flexibility and adaptability is required because of the changing business environment, the dynamics to quickly adopt to that change to become flexible. Agile approaches are required. It is very essential for organization to become agile for their sustenance and growth. There are various agile methods and practices that focuses on iterative development. Typically any agile methodologies follows iterative approaches. Requirements and solutions are obtained through self-organizing cross-functional teams collaborating. So collaboration is very important. Any of the agile methodologies we come across, we speak about uh, cross-functional self-organizing teams. 
So this is the basic details one should know when they hear the term Agile. So question number two, explain the difference between a traditional waterfall model and Agile testing. So when we say Agile and waterfall, it has two different dynamics altogether. So Agile model is a continuous iteration life cycle model for developing and testing software. Whereas waterfall is a linear sequential life cycle model for developing and testing the software. So similarly, the rigidity. So agile methodologies is flexible way of building a software which provides a lot of flexibility. Whenever there is a change, adopting to the change will become very easy, adapting and adopting for the change scenario. Whereas in waterfall methodology, it is a bit difficult. It is rigid because it is very much structured. Any changes which comes in, adopting that and changing things to according to the change dynamics requires changing many things, which makes it very tedious and rigid. So thirdly, collaboration. So agile model is highly collaborative. That's what it approach uh, considers mainly towards software development, where involvement of all the members, involvement of all the members like customers, uh, uh, maybe the team members, the uh, project managers. So their active involvement is very much required so that things can be handled better. So whereas waterfall model generally don't insist on that. So it is least flexible and follow sequence of steps which are predefined and that doesn't allow the team to collaborate. Even the collaboration happens, it will have a limitation because everything is defined and one has to follow it and comply to it. There is no uh, opportunity or options to change anything so easily when it comes to waterfall model. Then processes, the entire process of development is divided into iterations which are of short period. So that in each of these iterations, the working model, working piece of that uh, product will come out. So in waterfall approach, the software development process is broken down into several phases, sequential phases, linear phases. So things which has to be delivered in each of the phases are very well defined and accordingly it happens. So changes, changes may be made even after the initial planning is completed in agile approaches or in agile, uh, whenever over follow agile. It is easy to adopt to that change scenario. Whereas in waterfall approaches, development requirements cannot be changed once the project development begins. It will become difficult because everything is defined in a comprehensive way, detailed, so that small changes may impact other parts of the, the products or descriptions which is defined. So software development is a collection of many different projects which can happen in agile. Whereas waterfall software development is completed as a single project or deliverable. So testing, testing is performed in same iterations as programming or building. So within that iteration, since we build the working product, all the testing will be done within that. So that one would be fully informed about that product, which is being developed in the iterations so that users can give the feedback quickly. Whereas testing phase is separate in uh, waterfall approaches but however testing can be built in parallel in waterfall also if it is planned that way but still it does not give that flexibility as it is there in the agile because the product will not be available to the users to give their feedback so that necessary corrections cannot be made so whatever testing reveals in uh, waterfall methodologies the corrections will be done by the team limiting to their understanding whereas in agile since users are very closely involved working model is ready so the feedback is straight from the users in their perspective so that corrections can be made and ultimate product will be very much useful to the people who are going to use that product ultimately. So question number three, what are some important parts of agile process? So here are some of the important principles that need to be followed to make a process of agile. So one is customer satisfaction. So very much important. One has to ensure customer is satisfied. Customer sees the product, gives the feedback, the users it, gives the feedback, necessary corrections are made in time so that quick delivery of the product can be made according to the requirement of the customers, which would result in high customer satisfaction. Then changing needs. So agile welcome changes. So any changing needs will be addressed even late in the development processes in the entire life cycle of the project, wherever the change comes in. Taking that changes, making that necessary changes will be easier when it comes to Agile. Delivery frequently. So ensuring software is delivered frequently, focusing on shorter time scales, which is very well uh, understood 
the full clarity of the product and the working piece of the product will come out of the iterations so as i mentioned earlier as well quick feedback from the users will also obtain so that products which are delivered will be as per the customer requirement so agile approaches helps that way work together so agile manifesto emphasizes on working together collaboration so that each one of them contributes so developers and business individuals has to work together through the course of the project so that necessary outcome can be created so motivated team so projects need to be built around motivated individuals and they must be trusted to get the job done so as i mentioned in the previous point collaboration is very important so we cannot ignore team as well who is actually actively involved in creation of those products so they should be motivated and their active involvement is very much required face to face conversation is most efficient means of communication so since the agile methodologies whatever is defined actually emphasizes on having the face to face conversation collaborating better uh, contributing proactively and involvement proactively is very essential so conversation communication plays a very important role so working software working software is a primary measure of progress which will be delivered in each of the iterations so that users can give the necessary feedbacks so constant pace agile process promotes sustainable development because all the products which are being developed used feedback obtained are in real time so people actually know what is being produced and what is that they can expect as it progresses so clarity is also one of the things and that pace has to be maintained and agile approaches helps to accomplish it so good design agility can be improved by focusing on technical excellence and good design as you progress as the changes comes in as you adapt and adopt so since it has the flexibility technically as well as process wise as well as uh, any of the uh, configuration wise it is easy to do the necessary changes and have the design which is required to accomplish the ultimate results simplicity the amount of work that's not being done needs to be minimized so we say simplicity is the ultimate sophistication means what is that required to be done consider only that not anything else above or below that so whatever we may require to do focusing on that the minimum thing what need to be done will be done and has to be done when one follows agile approach self organized the team is self organized so self organized teams provides best architectures requirements and design because they having various different capabilities come together contribute together with their capability with a different capability multi skilled as well will be present in the self organized team reflect and adjust effectiveness can be improved by the team regularly reflecting on it because as i mentioned earlier in every iterations there are feedback obtained testing is being done in each of the iterations as it progresses so this will help us in uh, terms of providing the insight towards how is it progressing so that will help in quickly doing the necessary corrections which are required to be done so next uh, question number 4 explain iterative and incremental development in agile so incremental development when we say the process is divided into many small workable increments so which can be done one after the other each successive increment builds on the top of the work done in the previous increments over time functionalities are added based on what was already created so iterative development involves the development of system by following repeated cycles or iterations based on the results from the most recent iterations of the process changes are made this helps the project evolve over time so the term evolve is the one which one should keep in mind it is not that i am just going that is my destination yes definitely that is a destination while progressing there are a lot of variations which happens those variations has to be considered and accordingly the necessary deviations or corrections adjustments has to be made and things to be progressed further which is very important because of this iterative approach it helps to become adaptable and flexible to adjust to these varying conditions so that's where project should evolve it cannot go in a straight line it has to evolve based on the variations while progressing towards the destination or the results what we are supposed to accomplish so agile definitely iterative plus incremental so agile involves consideration and creation of working product in an iterations 
which is part of the overall final products. The consolidation of all the products which are produced in each of the iterations will become part of the ultimate results, ultimate product. Each iteration is an enhanced working increment of the final product. This process continues until all the product's functionalities are satisfied. So, organizations and users can use and experience the product and provide feedback that can be incorporated into next iterations. So, each iteration when the working product is produced, those things are used by the users, experience, uh, they will look at the features and functionality and based on the requirement what they are supposed to fulfill, they may also give the feedback for necessary corrections or they add new requirement to it because the minimum requirements what is being fulfilled by this product maybe some requirements which are not expressed earlier there is an opportunity to express at this point in time to state we can involve some of the features of this kind in the next iteration so that we can able to make this product better so such kind such a conversation the incremental iterative approach helps or allows or provides that opportunity to express so causing product roadmaps to be built produced tested and confirmed before the next iterations so that's where before we move to next iterations, there will be better clarity in terms of what is produced, what we are supposed to produce further and what is that modification we are supposed to do so that product can ultimately fulfill the requirements. So question number five, what are the different types of agile methodologies? So there are various kinds of uh, agile methodologies. Some of them are briefed here. So let us go through them one by one. Extreme programming. So it is a framework that enables team to create high quality software and improves their quality of life. It enables software development with appropriate engineering practices. So next is Kanban. This method is used to design, manage and improve the flow of systems. Organizations can visualize their flow of work limiting their work in progress. So basically Kanban comes from the Toyota system. So here when we use the term workflow, the work in progress. So this will help in terms of monitoring what is happening, what work is in progress, what work is completed and it uses a visualized system. So one can see it, what is happening. So it also enables the individuals who are doing it to know what is that pending against them and they can pick it up, pull it up and then complete it. Lean. Lean is a set of tools and principles that aims to identify and remove waste to increase the speed of process development. It focuses on maximizing value of the, to the client, ensuring waste is minimized. So lean uh, principles, lean approaches says the flow. In a flow, if there is any bottleneck, that tends to be removed. So this bottleneck would limit the flow and that would add towards the waste. So identification of the waste, the, the reason for the creation of the waste or who is the contributor of the waste and eliminating those causes and moving forward. This will help in smoothening the flow at the same time, improving the system for better outcome. So that's where Lean has become popular and well acknowledged. So Scrum is a framework that is used by teams to establish a hypothesis try it out, reflect on experience and adjustments. It is used to enable teams to incorporate practices from other frameworks depending on the team's requirement. So that's about Scrum. Scrum is a bit popular and it is mostly used for a smaller projects. The bigger the project, more complex, I think Scrum would not help. But Scrum is very popular uh, in software development organizations. So where uh, it has a simple uh, uh, five uh, events, three roles and uh, three artifacts. So it helps uh, to adopt and uh, adapt to the changing conditions and it has become a proven practice. Now Crystal, Crystal is an approach to software development that focuses on people and their interactions rather than tools and processes. It is aimed to streamline processes and improve optimization. It works on principle that projects are unique and dynamic. So next question. What are the principles of agile testing? So testing continuously to ensure the product improves continuously. So as we know, when we progress, when we adopt, when we follow agile approaches, there is a reason because we need to be able, we should be able to respond to that changes quickly. 
we should be able to understand what is going right what is not quickly and do the necessary correction then and there itself so testing continuously become very important because as we develop as we test we can reveal any of the issues any of the uh, defects in the product what we develop so that it reveals so obtain feedback continuously to ensure the product meets business requirements so looking at the performance does this features functionality of the product is helpful to accomplish that business requirement so this feedback comes from the customers and users when we produce that working piece of the uh, product so all team roles testing development etc need to be involved in testing process so one cannot work in isolation there should be very uh, good collaboration people from various different teams working together complementing to each other very essential to become agile so the active involvement of business teams and representatives can provide quick feedback for each iterations so clean and simplified code ensures it is defect free during iterations the documentation created must be limited into a particular iterations so when we speak about waterfall approach the documentation will be very comprehensive for the entire project but the moment we speak about agile the documentation will get limited to what is being produced in the iterations which is very important so what is being produced in iterations and that is based on the actually what is produced something i plan in for the iterations some changes happen so we developed it created it there is a feedback which is coming up documentation is limited to that so corrections which can be made to the documentation will be easier and quicker so along with development and implementation testing is done to ensure the product is defect free continuous involvement of users ensures the final product matches their requirement which is ultimate uh, need so question number 7 what are some agile metrics that need to be focused on so some of the uh, popular metrics which are used are measuring burn down of deliverables which is usually represented using burn down charts similarly we have burn up chart also where uh, as we complete the task the height of the bar keeps increasing in burn up charts but most popular is burn down so that what is to be delivered will be easily visible so the velocity lead time cycle time code quality code covered in unit test deployment success rate net promote score so these are the basic metrics which are really needed when we are speaking about the velocity and speed at the same time how quickly we are able to produce what is supposed to be done and planned are we going accordingly or not so this will help in terms of uh, making our jo job as per the need so metrics has to be selected very carefully so metrics is not just a number it should have an interpretation and that interpretation should actually complement to the business needs and requirements so metrics should have an clear description of what is this measurement is all about and what is that we are going to understand from that measuring that metrics so next is what is kanban so kanban system is visual system which helps better management of work as work moves through processes so it is it visualizes and provides visibility into the process workflows and works passing through the processes so when you say is a it is a visual system so there will be board or a display system where each of the tasks which needs to be accomplished are displayed there and the person who is who is supposed to complete it and what is the status of it so people would look at it pull the work and complete it so since people pull that work it is also called as pull system so because the new works are pulled in taken up from the list for execution and move them from in progress status to done so kanban since it is a visual system it also makes people more conscious about what is pending against them what work is pulled that is also visible so there there is no reason for anyone to say that i did not do this because of xyz reasons since it is visible it is my job since i pulled that task it is my job my ownership to complete it it becomes like that so that discipline comes into place so tracking the work will also become easier as the workflow is clearly visible and put on the display board modern organization can also use the digital display systems we are seeing this more adoption in uh, many many organizations today because it the value of using it the contribution of it is seen by organization and kanban playing its roles in the organization and it is very essential to have this practice
So the goal is identification of constraints that is potential bottleneck in the process and ensure they are addressed. This ensures that the workflow becomes smoother and more efficient. I think I mentioned the reasons. Question number nine, what are some popular agile tools? So some of the tools which we keep hearing uh, today whenever, whenever uh, people say we do agile is uh, some of these are listed here like GitHub, Jira software, Trello, Zoho, Codex, Verizon one and many more. I think uh, before we choose a tool it is very important for anyone to understand what is that they require first and what tool can help them in terms of accomplishing it. So it requires a lot of uh, uh, analysis, uh, assessment on the tools and the uh, comparison with what is being done in the organization and how this tool would suit that organization's requirement is very essential. So tool is not first, the requirements, the need analysis and then what tools best suit the environment, that is the step. Only then selecting the tool makes sense. However, studying the tools and comparing the tools and the features functionality will also help defining uh, what needs to be there in place in the organization when they become agile or adopt and adopt certain practices. What are the obstacles to the agile process? So some of the obstacles that one could face are not having the appropriate or sufficient tools and technologies. So it is quite obvious organization struggle not having the right tools and technologies. As I mentioned uh, earlier, it is very important to understand what is our need first and what tools suits best. At the same time, I also mentioned study the tools and technologies and what to, do they offer and what do we have. Do we really need that additional things, the gap, whatever we find, do we really need those in our environment? Is that dynamics? Is there in our environment? That needs to be understood. The lack of active involvement from the customer. So when we say agile, involvement of all the stakeholders are very, very important because the changing needs comes from users and customers. Whenever the iterations complete, working piece is delivered, if customer doesn't respond or explain or provide the feedback, then moving towards the next, next iterations will become difficult. It is very essential, the active involvement of the stakeholders and very important stakeholders is users and customers. The team members lacking in skills and capability. So one has to ensure the team members are groomed with the right capability and that should be evaluated on a continual basis so that organization can handle things in an agile way and contribute towards the projects what is being done and become agile. Some of the obstacles further if you can look at is the inability to design system based on unseen requirements. So this unseen requirement is very dynamic so when they will crop up we will not know but however the systems what we designed should be able to provide that uh, uh, opportunity whenever such variations happens you can able to easily adopt or involve or take that particular new requirement and plug in so otherwise one cannot become so rigid there should be flexibility adapting the agile culture to the organization so culture plays a very important role so a lot of resistance would come across to adopt the new way of doing things people may not uh, appreciate uh, the agile way of doing things so it requires a lot of uh, effort, motivation and uh, making people to understand why the organization has taken up uh, the task to make it uh, agile and building a culture where people would think in agile way and contribute to the organization. Question number 11, differentiate between agile and scrum. So the term agile as I mentioned earlier refers to ability to move quickly and easily by becoming more flexible and adaptable. Whereas uh, Scrum is an agile methodology which enables organization so organization can become agile. So agile manifesto and 12 principles acts as guidelines to become agile. Whereas uh, Scrum is used in the projects where requirements are constantly changing aligning to agile manifesto and 12 principles. They, they should follow what is told in manifesto and uh, principles. So Agile Manifesto mentions about the required collaboration interactions to become Agile. Whereas uh, Scrum defines the roles, the Scrum Master, the Product Owner and cross-functional self-organizing teams who are involved in uh, making the project, delivering the project in Agile way.
so uh, agile manifest also mentions uh, about the required focus on working software and focus on change whereas a scrum approach uh, enables teams to react to changes quickly so means how to become flexible what is that we need to consider to become flexible is defined in manifesto means stressed on it whereas a uh, scrum follows with that approach one can become easily flexible so delivery the manifesto provides necessary guidelines on frequent delivery of software so where scrum uh, with the sprints it build, builds are delivered to users regularly and upheld agile principles so collaboration agile manifesto stresses upon individuals interactions and customer collaboration so scrum does it through various events like daily stand up meeting and other scrum events like sprint uh, meeting sprint retrospective whereas people are sitting and discussing about writing a user story the epics or selecting the product uh, from the product backlog to the sprint backlog so various events which happens in scrum demonstrating that uh, uh, point which is stressed in agile manifesto about individuals interactions and customer collaboration by are demonstrated with various different events in scrum methodology so next question what are some popular agile certifications so some of the popular agile certifications are pmi acp certification which is offered by pmi us scrum master certification then certified scrum master prince 2 agile certification then scrum product owner certification so next we will move to a scenario based questions so before we uh, go and answer the scenario based questions let us look at the scenario what the scenario says the manager x was having the discussion with the team about the upcoming event the event was scheduled to conduct a online marketing campaign to increase the sales due to increased competition and rapidly changing customer behaviors the campaign is very crucial and organization has decided to do it more often this is done through the online platform the organization has the requirement of integration with organization's website with all the features and functionalities the various roles involved in the marketing campaign are marketing manager marketing team campaign coordinators creators of content and brochures for campaign and the participants of the campaign all of these roles should have access to platform through registration so that they can have the required access and make the marketing campaign successful besides marketing manager has told the reports needs to be generated which depicts the number of campaigns conducted responses registrations conversations etc so this scenario is speaking about uh, the marketing uh, challenges or problems what organization has and through that problem statement they wanted to ensure to do the marketing campaign and also they want to have an online platform uh, to ensure to make this uh, marketing campaign successful and also speaks about the various different roles involved in this so let us look at what are the typical questions which would come across in such scenarios so first question says can you write a user story from the perspective of marketing manager and participant so firstly we need to understand what is this user story is all about so in the perspective of marketing manager is something anyway we will look at it what it is but user story is the one which depicts the requirements assuming the role as a specific role i need to do this i want to have this it it gives certain explanation so that one can easily understand about that requirement what need of consumers or what need of business this particular features functionality is going to fulfill so let us see what is that uh, user story uh, relating to marketing manager and uh, participants so yes why not here are few examples marketing manager user story says as a marketing manager i need to assign the activities task to the team members so now whenever we develop that platform there should be an access to marketing manager and marketing manager can able to assign the activities to the team members so what feature that particular platform should have has to be defined and designed accordingly and this is the requirement the participant perspective as a participant i need to register for the campaign so now there should be a registration page obviously and then uh, whatever the process needs to be followed to create that uh, registration for the participant that needs to be made and this simple user story helps into visualize what features functionality has to be there 
when we go and create that product and services. So this will help understanding the requirement thoroughly and creating the designing the features accordingly and visualizing the flow as well. So next question is agile the best approach to make a marketing campaign and why? So now question arises should we, when we do marketing campaign why should I uh, follow agile why not I do just like that. Now why do we need agile what is that essential need because already I mentioned the need of agility uh, it requires I mean whenever there is an adaptability whenever there is dynamics of changes whenever I want to become uh, someone who can able to become competitive because competition is also responding to the dynamics of the market quickly I should be there in that business so obviously uh, does uh, the, this question make sense the, can this marketing campaign can be done in the agile way so obviously yes because the agile approach is the best way to go with for marketing campaign reason being the rapidly changing uh, behaviors of the consumers which has to be understood and detail should be put in their perspective and accordingly the features has to be provided so always in the consumer perspective customer perspective Secondly, with increased competition, the organization has to consider the unique differentiator to sustain and grow. There should be uniqueness. That needs to be understood. And that requires exercising continuously and uh, creating the products accordingly. So this marketing campaign would help to understand that. So next question, what are the typical product backlog items? So for this, what could be the typical backlog items? means the list of user stories list of epics which can help in terms of defining the features and functionality the typical backlog items may include the features like registration page login page campaign contents platform to conduct campaign assess requirements so likewise we can keep writing so user stories helps us to list what is that we may require to develop in this product so this requires a lot of collaboration and discussion only then I think uh, that will become more visible. Next question is what are the some considerations made while selecting the items for product backlog. While selecting the backlog item to each iterations from the product backlog the backlog item has to be prioritized definition of done for those items to be selected value delivered improvement considerations etc has to be made. So prioritization is very very important what features functionality I should develop first and how it makes sense to my business how users will be helped how customer will get benefited so these will help in terms of having those features functionality developed in such an order where for that moment that features and functionality are available we're not just jumping into everything and doing it one by one in a order in a prioritized list so it is very essential to prioritize defining uh, the definition of done and selecting the items accordingly and then what value it delivers understanding that and improving next question is the involvement of marketing manager required during the project and why it's quite obvious marketing manager in, in involvement is very essential because it is a marketing campaign yes the involvement of marketing manager is very important and crucial and it is the role who will have the full visibility into the requirements to be fulfilled and on ground realities Besides, one cannot become agile without the active involvement and collaboration of customer users with agile teams. Here we come to the end of this video. Hope you got a good knowledge of agile methodology. If you like this video, subscribe to Simply Learn and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from us. Thanks for watching. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts. Choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.